This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. The following show is our second in a series of what we refer to as IAQ Radio Plus Classics. This IAQ Radio Plus Classic is a compilation of three shows we did on the history of the restoration industry with the industry's global watchdog, Pete Consigli, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. We have combined all three shows into one feature-length IAQ Radio Plus Classic episode. We have also put together transcripts for all three shows. They are on the website following the Z-Man's blogs for each of the shows. We hope you enjoy this important historical perspective on the restoration industry. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. IAQ Radio Platinum Sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Gold sponsors are Particles Plus Engineers and Manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at Healthy Indoors. Com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at iaqa.org and RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. All right, we've got the, the consigliere here today, Pete Consigli. Great to have you with us on IAQ Radio. We're going back in time a little bit. I want to start with where, where did Pete come from? Where did Pete Consigli come from? Well, Joe Cliff. Great to be here, and um, we're glad to have you. Yeah, it's good. thank you. I uh, actually, but before I kind of say where I came from, I uh, I kind of want to say you know that this uh, any of you uh, any of the listeners out there that are sports fans realize that uh, for about probably about the last month, uh, ESPN has been playing uh, a lot of clips from the very famous Jimmy V uh, uh, speech after the you know uh, before he passed away several several years ago and they have the ESPY awards every year and there's a one clip in particular which uh, to me is uh, kind of what I think the show's going to be about today Jimmy V says that every person should do three things every day he says they should laugh they should think and they should have their emotions uh, moved to tears he says if you laugh you think and you cry every day so that's a full day so Anyway, uh, that's what I kind of see us uh, doing today. Looking forward to it, Pete. Yeah. So where, so, did, where did the, 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 the watchdog come from? Well, well actually, the Consigli. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, so, you know, my, my name is Consigli, but the, the root foundation of my name is Consiglieri. And actually, if you did a spell check, you know, in the, in the Yahoo, uh, an Italian spell check in Yahoo, it, and you just spell my name, Consigli with an E R E in the end, it actually comes up as the proper name. And that, you know, in the Sicilian vernacular, a consigliere is an advisor to the family. And um, so I don't know, maybe it was in my DNA to, uh, you know, to this stage of my career to be a consultant and advisor to to the industry and to clients and people. And uh, you know, it's a real honor and a privilege. I um, uh, so you have to put it into context. Um, where did I come from? So I was, you know child of the 60s, a baby boomer, just like Cliff, Joe, like you guys. And um, in, uh, in 1972, um, I, uh, uh, I, uh, I took a trip around, uh, you know, around Europe. I traveled to, to parts of North Africa. And then I kind of, I came, you know, I came back, back home and I had to decide what I want to do when I, when I was going to grow up. I was 21 years old and, um, you know, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, uh, my my mother's side of the family is Sicilian, and uh, my father's side is Italian. <laughs> uh, there there is a difference, and, uh, <laughs> and um, it, it, that part of the family came from Parma. That's where they make prosciutto. 
And so um, my family at the time had bought a uh, had bought a condominium up in Stamford, Connecticut, and it was going to kind of be a retirement area when Stamford was a little town. And I went up there, and um, I was kind of living up there. And I answered an ad in the local newspaper, and it wound up being Ele- Electrolux. And Electrolux, you know, came from Old Greenwich, Connecticut. The name was very well known. And uh, next thing you know, I'm I'm, uh, I'm selling Electrolux door to door to a bunch of old timers. And um, and I I met this guy. Uh, there were a lot of uh, laid off uh, guys in the area who were engineers and stuff like that. And they were all out selling Electrolux in the early 70s. And as we're knocking on doors, and you try to go sell a vacuum cleaner and a full package, which included the, the rug shampoo. So what happens is we have to demonstrate. It's kind of like the old Apple Costello movies with the vacuum, and you know they dump all the dirt on there, and then there's no there's no there's no plug in there, you know, no electricity, right? So what happens is we're cleaning the rugs, and the customer starts saying, you know, we're not really interested in the vacuum, but how much would you charge to clean the rug? So we quickly realized we could probably do better cleaning the rugs than we could trying to sell the vacuum. Right. So the next thing you know, we're we're shampooing and cleaning some rugs anyway. To short, you know, to, to shorten the story, what happened is I, me and this fellow named Rudy, we wind up, um, uh, uh, we got into the business. We got into janitorial services, carpet cleaning, you know, that ultimately led to some of the, the counts that we were doing, both in the residential and the commercial markets, had some flooding, and we were wet back in the water, not really knowing what to do, throwing some fans in there, and that, those were the early stages of uh Really, how I, I suck in hope days, man. Yeah, and that, that's that's basically how I, I got into the industry, and then that kind of became my life. That was the beginning of the journey. Okay, and then uh, as I understand it, you and Cliff, the Z Man, first met like in the late seventies, and then you know you got a Sicilian kid from Brooklyn, a Jewish boy from the Steel City. You know, uh, tell us a little bit about the beginning of that relationship. Yeah. Well, anyway, you know, it's funny with the Godfather, you know, the early roots of the Godfather really go back to, to two Jewish boys and uh, two Italian Sicilian boys. And that was uh, Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, um, Bugsy Siegel, Benny, and, uh, and Frank Costello. And they were in the Lower East Side of New York. They were immigrants, and uh, they were being picked on. And uh, those were kind of the roots in the early days. And so, I don't know, maybe there's some kind, there's some kind of, there's probably something in the bloodline between them. Why the, the Jews and the Sicilians, you know, were such good friends in business and in life. But what happened was, is um, so okay, so I'm in the cleaning business now in the '70s, right? And things are moving up pretty good. And me and this fellow Rudy, we got a little office in downtown Stanford, and we're starting to get to be known in the area. We used to do a lot of high-end uh, residential cleaning. He went to the commercial route, and then I wound up picking up a very important commercial account early in my career. It was a the big law firm in Connecticut that shared a building with a bank. And the bank, they had they had mandatory janitorial services, but the, the janitorial service was awful. I mean, just terrible. So they actually hired me as a supplemental guy to come in and clean up after the janitors. And, I, and it took me about a month to get the building in shape. Well, anyway, at one particular point now, a few years in the business, we're building a little bit of a rep, and I decide that I'm going to go get some really new fancy uh, carpet cleaning machine. And I, got, I had to go take a $5,000 loan out from the bank, and I got some really big fancy systems. So now what I want to do is because I want to try to see if I can sell this uh, this law firm who, who I have a lot of confidence in me that I want to get the carpet cleaning contract. And a little bit I know back in the day, there's a big difference between doing janitorial work and just buying fabric and textile cleaning. So what happened is I go in there, and the guy was very polite to me. They really loved me. He said, you know, Pete, we're real happy, but we have a guy, you know, we're pretty happy with this guy, and it's been going on, you know, pretty good. So I said, that was it. So I, I started uh, uh, moving into the carpet cleaning and doing a bunch of work. Well, one day, a Saturday, I'm in the building. I used to do this work in the weekends right after the normal janitors weren't there, and I'd clean up on him. I run into this guy in the elevator, and he's kind of an old, crusty kind of looking guy, and he looks at me, and he goes, so you're the kid who tried to take my carpet cleaning account. And I go, who are you? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. He goes, he says, I'm, I'm a carpet cleaning guy, right? But anyway, his name was Bill Densky. He was a fireman, ex-fireman. And a lot of firemen got into this business many, many years as, you know, second jobs, cleaning, restoration. And um, we got to be friends. He liked me, took me under his wing. And I said, uh, I said so what's the next, you know, how, what, what's the next thing? What should I do? You know, so he kind of showed me, the, explained kind of the mystique of it and, why janitorial and window washing was different than carpet upholstery cleaning the high end. Anyway, so he said to me, look, there are organizations you can go find if you want to advance yourself. So I'm in the business about five years now. This was like 76, 77. So he said there's two of them. He said one of them was called AIDS, A-I-D-S, AIDS International. And that was the second name of RAA. They started out as National Institute of Rug Cleaners in the 40s. 
Then they changed the Association of Interior Day Corps Specialists in 1980 for the obvious reasons. They rebranded to ASVR, and then in 2007, we rebranded to RA. So it's almost 70 years we've had four names. But the other organization, he said, was called SCT, Society of Cleaning Technicians. And, of course, they've been rebranded to Society of Cleaning Technicians, the International Society of Cleaning Technicians, and then now today they're known as the Society of uh, Cleaning and Restoration Technicians. So what happened is, then this is how I met this fellow named Ed York. And um, so I actually uh, I went to a, 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 an SCT convention and was a member, and um, and I kind of saw the grassroots part of the industry. And then in 1977, I went to my first uh, AS, AIDS convention, ASCRIA convention, and it was in Bal- the Bell Harbor, Sheridan Bell Harbor in, uh, in, in Miami. And this is when I first met Cliff. And actually, the very, very first uh, table that I ever sat at as part of a group lunch was with, uh, with Buzz Dohanian, but the Buzz Sr., I mean, the dad. The Buzz Jr. is one of our past presidents, and him and Ellen Armand. Armand. The Armand. Well, they're both Armand. 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 Yeah, right. they're both Armand. And, uh, and that was kind of how I was indoctrinated into the industry. And uh, anyway, I met Cliff in the trade trade hall. And you yeah. Had to, yeah. Incidentally, that was the first uh, RA that we had ever attended right. at. So he had, he had, he had, he had this, this pet skunk named Petunia, and they took the glands out, and he was, you know, he was promoting his, his products. And, uh, you know, uh, they, 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 he had the smoke deodorization. It was, uh, you know, pet odor control kind of products and that kind of stuff. And anyway, we kind of hit it off, and I started looking at some of his products. And then over the next couple of years, um, there were some regional associations. Me coming from the Northeast, I belonged to two regional associations. One was the New York Red Cleaners, and then the other one was the New England, the NEIRC. And, and there were deep roots in both of those organizations with the, the ASCR, REA over the years. Both still around, right? Both, both they're all, of course, they're all around. They're all shareholders of the IACRC. But right. those are my roots. I belong to all these associations at one time in my career because they were the regional groups and I was in the business. I yeah. see. All right. And what about the, the – I've got to note the early years of the innovators. Yeah. What, what does that mean? Yeah, so this, this is really something. <laughs> and, you know, so what happened is right around that time in the mid to late 70s, the way that guys in the industry really started to learn and network was is that they, they, they were, it was done by the suppliers. So there were, there, the famous and the most early suppliers in the industry were, were Hydromaster, ProChem, um, ChemSpec, uh, Unsmoke, um, CleanRight, and, uh, and, and, and Lloyd's. These were the these were the, the these were the original innovators. These were the first guys, and every one of those have legendary owners. Mike Palmer, uh, Bob Langley was a legendary sales guy for Hydromaster. Jim Roden and uh, and um, you know and the Roden family and Joe Do- Joe Doman uh, Doman I said pronounce Joe Doman Joe Doman from ProCam, and then um, Murray Kramer and the Clean Right guys and Arlen Knight you know was one of those guys. These were all the, the pioneers. Lloyd Weaver and his son Lance. And what happened is, uh, and, and of course, uh, Cliff, you know, and his brother Arnold, and they would put on um, classes around the country, which were the early classes. And during that time, they actually had a show called The Innovators, and they went around and they put shows on. And this is what people want in the day. There was, you know, there was no IICRC yet. There was no formal training or anything. People just, they wanted these supply shows. They said, okay, we know you want to sell us some stuff, but give us good information. And they were. They were educational deals. It was always business marketing done with the technical and this is how the industry grew. These were the early early roots, and those really are all the points, the key pioneers in the cleaning area and the restoration area. Those companies that I named, those were the ones. Those were the ones then. There may be some others that were left somewhere out, but those are the main ones. And I, I think what it led to, though, is that um, at, at this event, um, you know, we would rent an exhibit hall. Each of us would have an exhibit. Each of us would do a presentation that was very geared towards ed- education. We weren't up there selling, we were there educating. And we were trying to raise the interest uh, of the attendees because the first industry first training classes followed immediately thereafter. So what we would do is um, if people were interested in you know, what we had to say, a lot of times they would stay over for a one day class and that might be water restoration, odor removal, uh, spotting, upholstery cleaning, uh, you know, uh, they would be like immediately, that could be like the second day of the class. So these these groups, um, 
primarily started as cleaning groups, but now they're all involved in, in restoration to some degree, too. I mean, as far as the, the Hydra Master and the Pro Cams and all that. Yeah, I mean, to, to a certain degree they are. I mean, you know, some of them just do equipment. Some of them do the chemical product line. They all, to some degree, are involved in training. The original training was just how to use our products and systems, and then eventually now it's kind of come to industry standardization and the certification classes, et cetera. You know, and, of course, the classes have to be more generic, and you have to mention multiple names. But at the end of the day, even today, I actually believe that guys want names of stuff. They, they sure. don't, don't tell me non-volatile. What, what product do I need to buy? You know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I, 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 don't, I think what they want to know is what product does the instructor use. And I think a lot of times that cuts right to the chase because if, if they believe in the instructor, and I'll tell you, as an instructor, the last thing you want to do in hands-on training is use a product that doesn't work. I mean, there's, not, there's nothing more. Yeah, that's like killing the class. Right? There's nothing more embarrassing than, you know, it's like you're the magician getting ready to pull the, the rabbit out of the hat, and all of a sudden there is no rabbit in there. Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, confident-wise, you want to know. All right. Well, let's let's go to the next topic here. Pete goes west. What what is that? What exactly do we mean by Pete goes west? All right. So this is what happened in the seventies. You know, when I got into the business as a Stanford, Connecticut, I served you know very uh, high income you know area. Um, in the in the mid in the in the late seventies, I um, I kind of had a little bit of a dalliance, and I worked for a, a, a very large, recognized uh, the primary rug carpet cleaner. Uh, in, in Stanford, Connecticut, it was, it was called Schaefer. And William Schaefer was one of the first presidents of the old National Institute of Rug Cleaners in two years in a row in the, in the 40s. Now that's owned by a fellow named Steve DeMarco of Triple S, but they were competitors in the day. Eventually they kind of bought, but they were the most uh, famous in the, the whole area. And we used to go down to we used to go down to Westchester County, which is in the New York area. One of our accounts for years was the Westchester Country Club where they play the U.S. Open, you know, and, and then we got, I got to meet and understand who executive housekeepers were and a lot of the buildings in New York City and the high-maintenance hotels like the Trump Properties and, uh, and, uh, and the Harley that was owned by, um, uh, what's her name, uh, Leanna Holmesley and people like that. So we, used, we used to do a lot of business like that back in the day in the New York market and uh, in, in, in Southeast Connecticut. And um, so during that time, I worked there for about a year, and I, I really made my bones in understanding all the different differences in the on-location cleaning processes for carpet upholstery rugs, implant rug cleaning, orientals. You know, that was a lot of background. Well, and, uh, and then I met my, my fellow Bill Bensky, and I got to the associations. Well, at that time, I was uh, I had a girlfriend there, was pretty close. She was uh, she's the one who always says my husband's uh, Sicilian, he's not Italian, and and then. Uh, Anyway, she's not the Latin, you know. It's, uh, that's in Naples. That's where pizza was invented. That's where the most beautiful Italian women come from, Sophia Lorenzi, you know, all the bridge, all that. And uh, anyway, so what happened was is um, she wanted to move. Her sister had moved out to California a, a couple of years earlier, and there was some reason that I don't need to talk about on the show, but I, we decided to move and go west. So we were going to move to San Francisco. Now, in the 70s, I had been out to California, traveled around the country, did some stuff like that. But I hadn't really never been up to the Bay Area. It's a place that was really interesting to me. You know, there was an analogy in the 60s between Greenwich Village in New York and uh, Hey Asbury in San Francisco. So what happened is I researched the area, and at the time, SCT and Ed York had a thing called the Associates Program, which was actually in um, their technical binders when you remember. And there were three parts of the Associate. One of them was the concept. The second one was the procurement company, the guys who got the work, and the third was the production company, the people who did the work. So I thought I could be a good production company. I had all my... Clean right stuff. I had my, my Lloyd's Porter dryers. I had my unsmoked thermal gen. You know, I had my Hydromaster truck mount. I had all that kind of stuff, and I wanted to go. So I, 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 I called Ed York, and I said, Ed, I'm, I'm looking to go to San Francisco area. Can you give me the name of three or four guys out there who might be interested in, in hiring me as a production guy, and they would need that? So I, I interviewed a bunch of companies, and I settled with one with a company in, in Fremont, California, a guy named Don Larson. And he had a company called Warwalk. Warwalk stood for Larson and Walker. And he was an ex-cop. Uh, that had disability and he wanted to get into the restoration business. And what he did is he ran the business, like with the 10 code, with Motorola radios, you know, 10-4, 10-8, and 10-7, you know, all this. Uh, what's your 10-20, you know? And, um, and he had the flasher lights and partnered it with the local uh, uh, fire department. Well, what happened is Ed York had heard about this guy through some other people and he was developing the original model for DKI. And what happened is they came down and Don Larson MO, how he operated with colored hard hats, was the beginning of finishing the model for DKI that led to the DKI. And I was early then, we used to call them um, uh, restor not, uh, uh, 
project manager was like RCO, Restoration Control Officer, was the tagline name back in the day. And so what happened is I, I made a deal with him. I handled all his cleaning aspects under the restoration company, Learn Restoration. I had known some restoration, but he was kind of more of a grassroots with SET, and I brought kind of the ASCR model out there, and this was kind of the beginning of me going from the East Coast to the West Coast and the merging. And, I mean, I, I lived out in the Bay Area for 20 years, and, uh, you know, I had a four-year stint when I went to go work with Dry East. We'll maybe talk about that a little bit later. But I was out there for 20 years before I kind of moved back east, you know, and then hmm. I kind of my, 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 my history has evolved in the industry. So I went west, and uh, I had a New York boy several years, and I'm living on the West Coast. Okay. And then during this period, um, there was the rise of the associations, or, or immediately, well, during that 20-year period, starting in the yeah. 80s. So this is yeah this this is what I call the rise of the association. So what happened is you have you had all these regional associations, you know, back in the day in the West Coast. And so then then while I'm in California, now I'm a member of what was called the CCI then the Carpet Cleaners. Now it's called CFI, and they rebranded, and they had a very close relationship with the CCI and W guys. So I was a member of that association. I was actually a board member. I was a, I was a director for what was called the Central Coast chapter, you know, um, in the in the Bay Area, and um, and. Uh, and now, you know, throughout those years, there was always a battle in the carpet cleaning area between the perceived bait and switch type of guys and between the, you know, the old style, you know, guys and charged by the square foot kind of guys. And now restoration was starting to kind of evolve and become more of a, 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 a industry mainstream. You know, uh, Dry East started in, uh, you know, 1981, caught Blackburn's basement with two products. He, he had these, these foam the easy block. blocks. The easy blocks was the uh, first okay. one. He did a national yeah. mailing. And then, um, you know, it started with a rotor mold. He took the Lloyd's, you know, from the metal quarter dryers to the rotor mold. And well, I think he had fiberglass first. Oh, well, that's right. He did have fiberglass. I forgot about that. And then he moved to the rotor mold and it kind of, you know, sure. set up. And that's, you know, you know, Cord was, a, I guess he had went to a Lloyd's seminar one time in the Northwest and he loved the idea. He was a carpet cleaner and he, you know, he started doing some water work and, you know, one thing led to another. So it's kind of an interesting, you know, the way it's evolved. So, you know, during that time, the associations really started to grow. They, you know, I, I think one thing that's important is that people that wanted to learn, that was really the only place that you would learn. They were very involved in training, and typically you know, they would have seminars, they would have the convention, and it was really all about primarily technical training. Yeah. I mean, that's what the, asso the associations provided two things. They provided education and training, and they provided the venues and vehicles to network. Let me clarify. When you say the associations, do you mean the regional associations? I mean all of them. Oh, all of them. Right. including the RIA. All of them. At that time, all RIA, RIA, SCT, all of them. They, okay. they, it was the beginning of the rising. And then what was happening is there were these regional associations, and many of them, who a lot of the people had roots back to the national group, sometimes one or other or both, you know, I mean a lot. And it was now the industry was starting to grow. And and uh, but the, but but one of the issues that later led to things, and you progressed it, they all want to have their own shows, and there were too many shows to go to, and too much overlap, and then it was difficult. The suppliers couldn't support them all; they had to choose. Uh, even the even the cleaners and restore. I mean, how many things do you need to go to? How often can you be away from your business? I mean, you want to learn and network, but you still also have to run your business. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I think, I think a lot of it was cost driven too, Joe. You know, if you were smaller. You would kind of, you know, smaller ships stick, you know, st stuck closer to shore. You would, the, the dues were lower. Uh, it was less expensive to, you know, to go to Seven Springs or, right. or, or whatever than it was to, you know, travel on a national basis because travel was, you know, was expensive back then. And uh, when you say there, there were a lot of shows, can you compare that to today? Yeah, well, no, you can't even compare it today. What happened is every one of those regional organizations had, had a show. Had a, had, 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 had a convention. Two, had a convention, a two-day convention. Eventually, in the probably somewhere in the 90s, that's what led to the whole idea and the concept of connections, okay? And connections at the time started with four West Coast regional and then kind of expanded, and then, you know, it's evolved. Okay. So so it, it, what it was was is that the, the industry had to kind of come together to – to make it easier for the suppliers, for the attendees, you know, for speakers, things of that nature, that you just couldn't have all this overlapping. People are just not going to spend their whole life on the road going, you know, it was just difficult. So okay. that, that was kind of the beginning of that. All right. All right. What about, let's, let's go into the microband story. With yeah. The microband story with the left coast bureaucrat. Yeah. What's that mean? Uh, so here's, here's a little funny story that we'll tell here, and, you know, we've got a couple of them in there. So look, so this is what happened. So, 
I'm out of the, I'm out of, I'm out of the West Coast, right? And I bring all of my stuff out there that I've been using from the East Coast, which Hydromaster, and I got my ChemSpec stuff, I got Unsmoke, I got, uh, you know, I got uh, uh, the Lloyd stuff, eventually some dry stuff, but one of the things in particular was, was Microband. So Microband was a, a very neat product that had a much stronger East Coast input than it did in the West Coast. And, you know, later over the years, there were uh, EPA and there were registration issues, and there were certain things that Cliff had to do to make uh, uh, Microband at the time when he owned that to be used in, in both uh, California and in Canada also. So, uh, so what happened was is um, I'm in the office one day. Well, well, there was a supplier out there, and I had more stuff of some of the products that I wanted in my supply room than he had in the store, and I pretty much told him, I said, look, <laughs> I said, if you're not going to stock it, I said, I'm not going to buy it from you because I can get, a, 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 you know, like a volume retail discount, and I'm just going to, you know, uh, do it myself because I said, if you want me to buy from you, you have to stock the products. And so I actually, he actually started stocking products and new products he was unaware of and integrated with the products that he already had. So I got a bunch of microband stuff that I had been buying for years from Cliff, you know, whatever the retail disc volume discount was. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is I had several five-gallon jugs out of my place. So one day some guy shows up in my office, and the guy, I mean, he was like a cartoon character. He was right out of Central Casting, this guy. The guy has a white hard hat. He has a little string tie, and he's a big, boisterous guy with a with – a, um, with like a pocket protector, right? <laughs> and he has a clipboard. He walks in, and they, anyway, they find him to me. And he's doing some site inspection because of the, the pesticide overlap, and, they're, and now they're looking at the microband, and, they, and that's what the bureaucrats are sticking their nose in. So now he wants to quarantine all my products, and he says that the products are being used illegally, and you have that special licensing and all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, this is what I'm first hearing what FIF is about and all this. So what happens is he now wants to talk to the guy who owns that product and all this. So what happens is I call Cliff and I get him, and now I have him on speakerphone in my office. So Cliff's trying to explain stuff to him, and the guy's not listening, and the guy keeps going. He's going, but kind sir, kind sir. He's calling Cliff, kind sir. Kind sir. Yeah. Anyway, the bottom line was I had to put, I had to put security tape. I couldn't use the, I couldn't use the product. So Cliff, Cliff gave me a rebate back on the product. The product had to stay there. And I couldn't use it. And we couldn't use microband. And I'm figuring out, well, what do I do now? You know? <laughs> anyway, I can't remember how it eventually was fixed and what eventually happened. Eventually it was fixed. Eventually we had to get rid of that product. He had to rebrand with a new product. And then he, he gave me some new product. And then we we're back on target, you know, doing what we had to do. Wow. This is the California. Oh, program. man, it was unbelievable. I learned then that California is all about legislation and litigation. <laughs> and quite frankly, I don't think that's changed. That's what we call it, the left coast versus the right coast. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. Now, what's, what's the 750? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. The, no. <laughs> I heard it. The, seven, no, the 750. The 750 was the 707. What year was that, 750? That was the mid-'80s. So, so one of the things that Claude's doing as he's trying to build dry use in the early days is he decides that he realizes that essentially the air movers and the, des and the refrigerant dehumidifiers didn't get into des des desiccant technology to do serious drying. So what happens is he sources... The, the uh, desiccants, and he comes. He gets this. The, at the time, all the mother stuff was uh, was the old technology that had um, that was um, uh, um, uh, lithium chloride, and it was uh, much more volatile. It, ha it had a lot of power requirements to do the reactivation. There was old technology at the time that was called an old concentric drum technology, and what happened is some of that technology at the time it, it didn't separate clearly the, uh, the, the, the desiccant and the reactivation area, you know, where the airflow was coming through. Mm -hmm. So what happened is he found some technology that was patented that he thought was better technology and um, with the silica gel wheels, and he essentially uh, got a 750 uh, uh, CFM unit. At the time, the most common ones were the 600 CFM monthly units. They were the fleet, you know, in the country to dry in commercial buildings. He mounted it in a horse trailer and called it the 750. Well... Cliff, you know, Cliff talked about it as being one of the greatest marketing tools the industry ever saw, you know. So this was the beginning of desiccant technology where we are today. It's not just by accident that people show up and we got these and it trailers. Was, it was on. like $30,000. It was about 30, it was between 25 and 30, if I can remember. You got some attachments with it, you got some training. And at the time, when I worked for Dryas for several years, I actually headed up the 750 network, and I helped network a lot of the desiccant drying guys back in the day to get that got into the commercial drying. And then much of that work started uh, some of the methodology for pricing and how we established the scope started in the Bay Area. I, me as a contractor with my buddy Butch from uh, Ideal, 
uh, his his now his daughter Jacqueline basically uh, okay, runs the business, okay. right? She's she's on she's on the board. She's second generation, uh, you know, uh, restoration uh, company, and um, we started working together and uh, competing in the marketplace, doing jobs, and that was. Uh, Anyway, so that's the 750. It was interesting. The, yeah, seven, the 750 was the ultimate example of putting all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> <laughs> it was $30,000, yeah. and you can only be in one place <laughs> at, one, at, at, yeah. one, at one time, right? Yeah, so. yeah. But I, I'll tell you a funny story. When Claude was actually testing that unit out, there was some flooding up in a place called Camino Island, uh, uh, not too far from where Dries is up in the northwest, and there was this house that was flooded, the lady didn't have any insurance. They wanted to try it out. With at the time, and there was a guy named John Watson who was running this carpet cleaning business because he was dedicated to drive. So what he did was, there was an old lady that was in there. This is a true story, and, and listeners, I'm not embellishing this. <laughs> what happened is, um, he goes down there and they want to dry the entire house by putting it under this desiccated negative pressure. The lady is in the house. She's like wheelchair bound. She couldn't get out of the house. So it took about three days to dry the place out fairly good, and that's not where the three-day drawing came from, trust me, but what happened was they two, Claude goes down there to the house to check on it, and he was telling the story, he used to tell the story in some of the training classes, he said, said well, how's everything going? I'm the owner of the company, well, everything's going really good, and um, your men are treating me very nice, blah, 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 and he says, well, I just want to, you know, he walked around, looked, he was getting to go, he's almost out the door, and the lady says, you know, there's one thing, <laughs> and he goes, what's that, and he goes, I haven't had to go to the bathroom in almost three days. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a true story. Uh, my only comment to that: <laughs> she was lucky that her eyeballs didn't turn into raisins. Wow! Wow! All right, let's go to the next one, guys. I want to hear a little bit about the Milgo Microband War. Uh, so let me tell you about that. So I remember the place was saying earlier, he said... Well, what's the difference? Yeah, no, 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 no. So what happened is, so earlier, I was basically saying, he says, look, um, what guys in the class want to know is what's the start to use. And look, once we started doing IICRC training, following with their rules, we were serious about their rules. We had to use two or three names and all that in those days. And there were some instructors, some very great instructors. Let Joey pick up one. He's a terrific instructor. I told Joey one time, Joey would just stay with the, with the, with the actual uh, generic names. And I said, Joey, it's all good to do that, but the guys are confused because they don't know what product. I said, you know, and all that. So me and Joey used to have those conversations. Well, anyway, and so now I'm working for Dry Ease, and they have the Milgo product, right? So what happens is, um, and I was a microband user, but I also use Milgo and two because they're two different products. So one day I'm thinking, they're asking me, they want to know which do you use and what's the difference. And I don't know how to answer that without, number one, violating the fact I work with dry use. Number two, violating the ISU. I don't know what to say. Cliff gave me the answer. And I told Claude this, and Claude says, yeah, that's a good answer, too. He says, anytime anyone says they want to know the difference with Bill Microband, he says, one works and the other doesn't. He says, that's the answer. <laughs> right? so, so, so that's up to the guy in the audience. And so I said, in the way that's how I used to do it, I said, look. I'm not going to get up here, and we're not, gonna, we're not here to talk about that. We're going to talk about the properties of different products, what they are effective at. I said, you want to know more about it? I said, this class is hosted by a supplier, John Lundridge Point, whoever they were. I said, go talk to them. Talk to their technical stuff. This stuff. That's how we stayed out of it. Yeah. And to this day, you know, people got a kick out of it, and that was it. Well, <laughs> you know, my, primary, my, my only issue with it is that uh, at that time, the microband product was EPA registered. And what Dries had done is if I'm not mistaken, they went to ProChem. ProChem put the deodorizer. That was the second Mac Milgo product. The first one with the quad, that was the one, that was no, the no, Milgo SR, wasn't no, it? No, with no, the, no, no, no. Okay. The first one, first, was, one? Okay. first one was the, yeah. Okay. The first one was the glutaraldehyde product. No, no, it was the other way around, trust me. Uh, That's the Milgo SR with the glutaraldehyde. The very first one was the quad. The Milgo always was the quad. Okay. You can trust me. All right, All right. so okay. in any event, my, my, my primary issue was more with the, uh, it was more the glutaraldehyde. It was the second time. Oh, yeah, because what had happened was, what, what they did is glutaraldehyde, the, the companies that made it didn't want it to spray on carpet because it's a severe irritant and it caused a lot of issues uh, in, in health care because they used it as a sterile. And the way that they had marked it, it killed, but there was only a little bit of glutaraldehyde in the product. So... Uh, it was like way over the edge, and, and I, I had ethical issues. With, you, don't don't see it. It. you don't even see it anymore. I don't, no, I don't think. But, but. Well, at the time the product was developed, because when we went to the uh, 
to the stain resistant carpet, the, the, the quads basically affected their uh, the coatings and it, uh, it compromised the warranty. So a new product line came out. And anyway, that was that's really important cool. stuff for yeah. Pete. Yeah. All right, All right. Cliff, but Pete, both of you take uh, you, you take the CR, the Certified Restore, together. Mm -hmm. um, Not on purpose. Not on purpose. <laughs> it happened, right? And, and what year are we looking at here? It was 1988. So let me tell you what the difference right. is that. Marty started the CR program in, in 1980. He started developing in the late 80s. You know, he basically in 1971 is when he came to the to the uh, the, the, the NERC or I guess it was AIDS at the time before it was a SCR. He had uh, 40 restorers and um, you know uh, restoration guys, and they came under that umbrella, and that's how the division started, the restoration division of RAA. So then they decided that they wanted to develop some kind of certification. To uh, distinguish, you know, the, the, the more for the quality and experience restores was a certified restore program. So what happened is he they were putting that program on until 1985. In 19, Marty actually took a three-year sabbatical, and you could only take the CR program at the time, like home study. I think there were two guys. One guy I remember who took it was a guy named Guy, the past president from uh, Oregon. But only two guys took it because people didn't want to when go home. When did Reed take it? Uh, Reed Dow, uh, he was one of the very first class. You know, he was he was the class Jimmy leader. Barrett, uh, uh, Major Long, Reed Dow, these were all the first three. Gotcha. Uh, CR number one, two, three, four. Well, Marty was one, obviously. So what happened was, is um, they, uh, uh, in 1988, Marty's coming back from the Nevada. For that three year period, Major Long was actually the technical of the, the association. Marty comes back and the class fills up. They only are allowed to four people in the class. So they had two people that wanted to come. A month later, they were in a second class with about 10 or 15 people. It was kind of the overflow. So me and Cliff just happened to be in the same class. There were, there were two guys. One was Dan Jones, uh, Jones and Sons. His brother, his brother Scott now, I think, is effectively kind of probably running the match in the company. Uh, another, Ray Jones, are not related. Yeah, they're not related. Right? Who recently passed away last year. Very unfortunately, he... Uh, but he was the, he was the very first company that I believe when the predecessor to Belfort Intercon started to look to expand and grow, they bought his company for our that's Pittsburgh and he stayed on oh, the company here. I actually think his wife is actually still working with them here at the Belfort location in, in the area. And he he was there and anyway, there's a legendary guy in the association named Phil McLaughlin, who's uh, since passed yeah, we had him on the show. Yeah, had him on the show. And then we had uh, we had uh, uh, Steve and Tim DeBuren were in there. Everybody knows the Steve, you know, John Dunn Strategies. Yeah. And we had um, we had uh, we had uh, Denny Jensen, who was one of the you know one of the primary shareholders of, of uh, DKI. His uh, brother-in-law uh, Keith, Keith Bird and one of their partners at the time we were in the class. I mean, it was it was a real high-end class. A lot of guys. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. We had um, you know we had it, we, it was hell week back in those days. And I remember Big Phil was up there, and um, you know he kind of had a reputation for having a good time, and but he knew a lot of stuff, and he was really studying real hard. At one point, Marty said to him, he said, "Phil, you know," he says, uh, "you know, at the end of the week, after that kind of a serious test there, and he kind of kind of put it all in context." But it was it was it was a fun week. You worked together, and what that really started it started the relationship that people had when they went through that designation together, that they carried those relations on to life. I mean, it'd be no different than guys going to law school together, medical school, graduating. And, they'd and I don't even know if we picked the groups. They may be even assigned the groups, because I don't know how we got, it was, it was, uh, and they, I and Ray Jones. Right, and, what they used to do is, used, or, right, Marty used to put the numbers in a hat and we'd pick them out, right. and then we used to have to do little presentations on a topic and you'd pick it out of a hat and you had to prepare and get the topic or something that like that. That was like your study group. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. All right, and, and, Let's move to the next topic here. I've got a note. There was a legendary lunch conversation with Cliff Zlotnick, uh, I guess it's Claude Blackburn, Blackburn, Pete Consiglia. Is that Gary Leubin? All right. What's, what's up with that? Uh, so this is, this is, this is great. So what ha this is what happened. So there used to be the show, probably after the old ASCR show, which is biggest in the industry, the next biggest show in the industry was actually a regional show in the Midwest called MAPS. What does that stand for, Cliff? Uh, the Mid Midwest Association of Professionals. Right. right. And so what happened is, and, and John and I were big support. And uh, the work guys, I mean, there was basically, it was, I don't So, Will Gage and the Duraclean guys. Uh, Vince Caparello. Vince, right. the, the two of those right. guys, I think, started it, and it was a... Big, it, was a, it was a big show. Big show. It, it rivaled ASCR, but in the regional area, right? And so what happened is, so we're, I'm, I'm there exhibiting with Claude and Dry East, and Cliff's there with Gary Lloydman, you know, I think was the first uh, instructor. You know, Gary was the first unsmoke instructor 
the clip, like I was the first driver. <laughs> Right. right, and I was the first industry trainer to Claude because the original trainers were, were Cliff and Claude, and then they passed, and then sure. that's how it went down. Yeah. So what happened is the four of us decide we're going to have lunch one day. So you got Lot Nick and Lloyd on one side, me and me and Blackburn on the other. We're having lunch and we're talking, and we're talking about the stuff that we think the two companies have in common. Now, what what Cliff and Claude didn't know at the time is a bunch of the other employees at Unsmoke. And a bunch of the employees at Dry's were telling me and Gary respectively, he said, you know, try to get Cliff and Claude together, you know, it would make sense that Dry's and Unsmoke should merge and become one company, right? So that's when the actual first discussion took place. It was in 1990 or 1991 at this map show hmm. in Chicago, in the Midwest, uh, wherever it was the location they used to have it. And we had the discussion. And so what we basically told these two guys, we said, well, we think you're going to get good support for both Dryes and Unsmoke to merge the company, but unfortunately, the only two guys who had a different viewpoint were the two owners, so it never happened there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, several years later, it did. Okay. <laughs> so I thought you had the vision for that. I thought that that was all. Well, I, I, I actually had the original vision. Then I talked to the sales manager and people at Dryes, and immediately I said yes. And then, you know, Lloyd Bain and I don't know if Denary and Wiegand were there at the time, but basically what happened is, they all started talking, and everyone says, makes sense. And then the other thing is, I think we started talking to John Don and some of the suppliers, and, you know, they all handled both products, and we all came in to do the training, right? And they were the, they were both the leaders of the restoration area. And as I just started just casually asking around, they're going, yeah, it kind of makes sense. And then somebody said, somebody, I don't know, it could have been one of the John Don guys. Somebody goes, but so how would that work? You know, Cliff and Claude, they have pretty different personalities. Like they said, yeah, well, that's the problem. We can't get the two of them <laughs> Let's go. We're, we're kind of moving now along into the early years of the standards, all right? Yeah, so let me... Uh, what's going on? Is it all about... Well, you tell me. Yeah. So what happened is... is so in the late days, uh there were all kinds of problems and issues going on in Southern California. Southern California, for many years, was referred to as the Wild West. Not, not only because it was located on the West Coast, but in our industry, there was a lot going on there. And now I really actually think the Wild West figuratively speaking, is really the state of Florida, which is a different discussion maybe we'll talk about later. But so what happened is there was a lot going on there as the industry as the industry was evolving. And um, so what happened during those days, there was some litigation and lawsuits in Southern California based on some uh, flooding, some sewage backflows into apartment buildings, condos, and et cetera. And they were essentially construction defect uh, type losses. But there had been industry companies who had cleaned them up. I don't want to, even though it's public record, I'd rather not mention the names. But they were, they were, they were national, national, uh, you know, franchise networks, uh, corporate cleaning area mostly, not necessarily the restoration. And what had happened was they got embroiled in these lawsuits um, because the attorneys basically were suing builders, and there were all kinds of people involved. So some people in our industry got involved in these lawsuits. Well, what happened is when the lawsuits, and there was a, that was a. This is the beginning of the mold issues but, and sewage and all these related issues. What year are we looking at? Uh, late, oh, 80, late, late 80s. 80s. Okay. So what happened is during that time, what started to filter back to the industry since it was a public health issue, and some of it kind of came through the EPA kind of an informally, is these lawyers, there was no standard of care or best practice in the industry, so they, nobody knew how to litigate the case because they're saying, if you said a guy did something wrong, like he didn't clean it properly, he didn't drive properly, they're saying, well, then how – what was he supposed to do? Yeah, right. It was, it was only it was only anecdotal. How do we know? What right. How do we know what he's supposed to do? All right. So during that time, the, the we were told informally that if your industry doesn't kind of get together and you don't create some standards, there's government slap will do it for you, and you're really not going to like what the government does. At that point, the government kind of assisted, and they worked with a group of you know uh, people leaders in the industry, and there was a paper that was published like maybe 1990, and the paper was called Remediation of Sewage Backflow into Buildings. And... Uh, the Jeff Bishop, Gene Cole... Yeah, well, the, from the EPA, it was Gene Cole, it was Mike Berry, and um, uh, one other gentleman, sorry, I can't remember his name. From Restoration, it was Claude Blackburn, the Jeff Bishop. I think Larry Cooper was involved. There was a fellow named Nathan Suazo from Southern California. He did a lot of pioneering work in sewage cleanup. And, and Steve Swan, who was dry sky for years, lived up in Northwest. He's since passed. He was a pioneer, too. Anyway, they wrote this document, 
of what was happening in it all the way. Yeah, they had real strong RAA representation in that document. Yeah, and so so uh, so what happened was um, I, I was actually asked at the time to participate in the document. And I felt it unnecessary for me to do it because I'd worked with Dreiser at the time. I said, yeah, caught in there, you don't need two of us. So I actually declined. Larry, Larry Cooper was heading it up, and he actually asked me, no, Larry, you got caught, I don't need it. And you got Nathan and Steve, these are uh, good guys, they know what they were doing. And they were all, it was West Coast group, too. So what happened during that time, um, that document got published. That, what was in that document eventually was this category three of water damage to this day. Okay. And but what was really powerful about it for many years in the nineties, it was published in nineteen ninety four in the Journal of Environmental Health, which you mentioned was scientifically peer reviewed. So in many ways that document in the early nineties actually had more impact and more credibility than the very first S five hundred, the first document, because the IHRC was no answer, it wasn't anything, but they're saying, Well you have a document that's scientifically peer reviewed, they're category three. Yep. But that was the beginning of then how we developed category one, category two a lot of the language for the must and the should and the recommend, just, how to recommend. That, 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 in other words, it was a, that what that led to was the four- to five-year process to develop the first S-500, which was published in 1994. And um, Cliff and myself were, uh, you know, we were on um, the final editing committee. We were part of uh, the final process. The final editing committee of the very first document was uh, Cliff actually represented ASCR. Claude was on there. I was there, Larry Cooper, Jeff Bishop. And Claudia Ramirez, who was the executive director of ASCR, but she actually just was there because she was Claudia. She had a lot of good skills. Yeah, Larry's and, brother was the attorney. And Larry, Larry, Larry's brother, who was, uh, had been a carpet cleaner, was an attorney. Was good. He did a good legal review. And I'll never forget. We had, we had, uh, we had a, a meeting where we did the, the final two-day legal review. One was in the lawyer's office, and then the second one was a final editing, which we moved to some hotel in the Denver area. And during that meeting. Cliff came with specific orders from ASCR of what ASCR wanted to support the document, and he actually represented their voice, not Claude, even though she was the director of the board, gave Cliff the director. So they got into, Cliff brought this battle about this FIFRA, the, uh, the Federal Insecticide Descendantite Act, which regulates pesticides and a lot of these uh, mic microbial products we use, which landed to the, the, the kind surf story of microbands several years later. And he was basically trying to say how important it was that the industry you know, understood that these products, the claims, they're regulated by the government, like he's, my co shared a few minutes ago with right. his issues with microband and mildew, et cetera. And so at that particular time, he took a very strong stance on something, and he basically said if, 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 if the committee doesn't agree to this in the document, he goes, you know, ASCR is out of here, right? We're, we're, we're not supporting it. So what happens is, I guess he actually wore Larry down. Larry, ba we're close to lunchtime on day one. Larry basically says, okay, well, I come out of my chair. I said, what do you mean, okay, Larry? I said, is he, I, I said, because Claudia's sitting in the room. She's our director. I said, Cliff, do you have the authority to do the Well, the board gave me. I said, you can't hold a gun head to the committee. <laughs> what? This is the law. They can't violate the law. telling me. So I'm going, well, I, you know, we got to have more of a discussion. So Larry, Larry's looking, we're arguing, right? <laughs> so Larry says, look, why don't we break for lunch? He says, we'll come back from lunch. He says, and he goes, well, make P, they want to, Larry wants to make me the neutral moderator, and he was going to have this debated discussion between Claude and Cliff to talk about this product. And Larry makes his comment. He says, Pete's, Pete's neutral. Zlotnick goes, he looks at me with a, with a look of contempt now. He goes, he's not neutral. And he goes, he, and then he starts, for two years, he started calling me better than consider, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so we go to lunch. Uh, uh, Cliff doesn't come to lunch the first time. We come back from lunch. We're all back in the room, and Cliff is uh, Cliff comes in last. He kind of has his head down. And during that time, I, I, had, I, I happen to have a, a drying hat, so I put this drying hat on the table next to him. Cliff comes to sit down. Everyone's around the table. It's quiet. You can hear a pin drop. It, he's looking down. He doesn't see me. I say to him, Cliff, what makes you think I can't be, you know, impartial and be neutral? He looks up, sees the drying hat. The whole place laughs. We sit down. We did our business, we got back, and we basically, you know, um, we came to agreement. That, and consensus is a contentious process. We came to agreement to lead the publication. Now, What's the lesson there? What, is that, well, so here, here, go ahead, go ahead. here's the lesson. The lesson is consensus means that everyone has a chance to be heard and that, that you go through a process and then you have an agreement once everyone's been heard. Um, 
doesn't necessarily mean, you know, uh, the, the majority vote. I mean, there's all kinds of interpretations. But, but the important thing was is that it's confrontational, but it's confrontational because people take a position and they do it for the greater good because you, if you didn't have that dynamic, you probably didn't have, you know, all the different biases in the room to get, to get a, basically to get a good standard. So it's okay. In other words, it's not a bad thing as long as the intention is that we have rules of decorum, we have, we have, uh, you know, we have a, a, a manner to uh, to go through a due process, which obviously ANSI serves. We didn't have any of that at the time, and that we're respectful of each other's opinions. And then through agreement, we come to agreement. And you know, it's as, as simple as that. But there, there is something that clip. There was there was a story there which uh, which happened, which um, uh, about falling on the cutting room floor. And uh, before we move on to the next topic, you probably you probably want to defer to the Z men on this one. So, all right. Well, I think what happens is when people are passionate, you know, about an issue, and when you go through this process, which can be contentious, and you know, at certain points you win, there's certain that you lose, and so on and so forth. But you know, when you won one and it was hard fought, and everyone, you know, kind of agreed, you know, you, you know, you, the majority of the people agreed, it's in the document. You're probably going to look at the document pretty closely when it comes out, and you'll notice if someone takes the liberty of removing it and your point ends up on the cunning room floor and it's not authorized by other people in the group. Okay. So. Okay. IAQ Radio Platinum Sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Gold sponsors are Particles Plus Engineers and Manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at iaqa.org and RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. Cliff and Pete, and, and Pete in particular, have spent a lot of time setting this up. So we set the, set the background, and we're moving through the 80s now, and we've moved on through uh, the beginning of the standard period and the early years of the standard so I want to set it up now to go to the next topic along the line, and then we'll get more closer to the uh, current and the future. Let's go to the Dryes Symposium and the birth of Willie, the WLI. It changed the path of the industry. Yeah. So what happened is um, in the, in the uh, early 90s and around the time with the, when the standards were starting to be developed, you know, Claude came up with this idea for the dry symposium, and he wanted to have an industry event that dry hosted, but it wasn't about dry ease. It was about, uh, he invited everyone in the industry, and it was all about water damage. Back in those days, he was represented the, uh, the vendors of ASCR on the board. He had that seat, and Rizal was there. And he was always talking in those days that the association needed to do more stuff in the water damage area. And everybody always kind of thought Claude was saying that just because he was the owner of dry ease, but it really wasn't true. That's what the members wanted. And you, you had the old garden place that was still kind of fire, smoke, reconstruction, kind of, uh, you know, that type of a deal. So what happened is he decided to just do this thing on his own, to have this event. He invited everyone in the industry anyway. In the middle of August in uh, Burlington, Washington, you know, which, you know, several miles from major airports, yeah. uh, 300 people show up. And what that showed us back then was that if you give good content, timely topics with great speakers, people will go anywhere at any time. That's an important lesson that the industry needs to listen to, the associations, anyone who puts programs on. Those are the top things that people want. They, you know, time and date and location, they care about. But what they care about more is quality of the topic and the quality of speakers, period. And Claude put a great program together back in those days. Well, during all that same time, okay, so here's what happened in, in, in the Dry's one. I was involved in the program. I, hadn't, I wasn't working for Dry's anymore now. I had, I had left and, uh, and, you know, on my own. 
uh, I've had a little bit back into the industry for a while, and then later I, you know, I started doing some you know, consulting and training on my own. But I had a relationship with Rice for several years on the course with Cliff and Unsmoke uh, and training and through John Don and the suppliers that they represented. So what happened during that time was is um, there was a question on, on the evaluation that I actually told them to put on there, and I said if there was an organization in the industry that existed solely to serve specialist in water damage and drying, would you be willing to join? But what happened is there was several ASCR people there, including Cliff and others, and they thought that dryies wanted to start an association. They never did. It was never the intent. Dryies wanted the association to have to, to recognize to that. To do more restoration. Do, to, well, not more restoration. Water, water and drying. Water. Because it's the beginning, early days of the mold. mold okay. So what happened is that led to a special steering committee that got put together, uh, uh, Cliff was on it, Reed Dow, Mark Bradley, um, and Bill Warren. Yeah, Bill Warren. And what happened is they put a plan together that they were going to bring to the ASCR to say that they wanted to start a division. It was called the Water Loss Institute. We called it Willie, W L I Willie. It was an abbreviation. Mm -hmm. And um, they actually asked me to be on that committee. And I, again, turned it down at the time like I did with the standards because I had, was back in the Bay Area working with my buddy Butch, and I said, why don't you put Butch in there? I said, he's a, you know, he's an operator, an entrepreneur, he's a pioneer in the water area, so Butch was on there for that first year. And um, so they went, they went to, the, to, the, uh, to the ASCR, they pitched it to the board, and the divisional status was granted the Water Loss Institute. And I remember Joe Jones, past, past president, he said, uh, he announced it in 1995 in San Francisco, and he said, the ladies and gentlemen of ASCR, somebody asked and says, the association has a new kid in town, and his name is Wee! You know, like that, with his Oklahoma twang. And uh, that was the introduction of WLI. Well, why is this important, and what does this all mean? Well, throughout the 90s, the, the, the WLI started their, their, their annual conferences. And um, the symposium, they had theirs uh, every other year, 94, 96, 98, that was the deal. So there was a lot of overlap between what the symposium was doing and what the WLI was doing. Well, based on my relationship with both ASCR, WLI, and also DRIES, we were able to informally collaborate so the programs were complementary, not competitive. Mm -hmm. We had some of the same speakers. We modified the topics because we knew that everyone was going to go to everything. The, the, the symposiums were always done in August. The WLI conference were always done in October. You know, the second week of October was the deal. And so that's important that you get both the nonprofit sector and the commercial sector to work together for the greater good of the common constituents. Okay. And um, that, that, that worked great uh, throughout, throughout that time. But why, why did I say that it changed the industry, the path of the industry? Well, here's why. During that time, what the WLI realized is that they, the industry, we couldn't learn from each other anymore. We had to reach out and learn from others. So as we started to reach out and we started to look, they had a thing uh, in there called the Ambassador Program, and they, I was the educational director of the WLI for many years. Cliff was its first president, and they allowed me to be the goodwill ambassador for the Institute with sanctioning from the association. And what I did is I would go around, and actually on my own, my own expense, there was no budget. I went around, and I went to other industries, and I started to, to search, and I left them. I started to build bridges to ASCR, and so that, those were AIHA, the ASHRAE people, um, the legal communities, the medical profession, you know, the occupational physicians, mm -hmm. all these kinds of things. And this is how we met Steve Brook, we met Matt Pierce, we met Mike McGinnis, you know, the list goes on and on and on, Elliot Horner, I mean, I, Phil Morey, I, I could just keep going. And what happened is those people started kind of looking at our association. And back in those days, the IICRC, we shared this with everything. We brought these people into the S-500, the second S-500, and the industry started working together. What happened is we got two experts outside the industry who were able to help us, and they helped us grow. And I think this is important. Help make it better. Uh, yeah. All right, let's, let's move to the next one. I, I've got a topic, the legal symposium. And it's something, small hotel rooms and dinner in Chinatown <laughs> with the Sicilian mom. I bet I know who the Sicilian mom is. Yeah, well, the Sicilian mom is, is my mother, Vita Consigli, and Vita. You know, those of you who listen to The Godfather, the, 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 the Godfather of the family was Vito, Vito. Vito. And Vita, V-I-T-A, is the feminine of Vita. Uh, so my mother was Vita Consigli, and uh, 
family is from the Gulf of the Costa Lamari. It's a fishing village uh, north coast of Sicily at the other end of the island from Palermo, which is the capital of Sicily and the most famous city. But what happened is, you know, uh, my mom uh, knew a lot of my friends and people in the industry, and one of the things that uh, that happened is uh, during those Willie years, Cliff and, and myself went out and we did we did a bunch of pioneering stuff on behalf of the association, and, you know, we did it on our own dime. We never asked for money. We were volunteers and service the association. And what happened during those times, there was this really high-end legal symposium that was in downtown Wall Street at some big, huge legal firm and had an unbelievable agenda. And uh, it was sponsored by the Mid-Atlantic Environmental Hygiene Resource Center, which was Merck. And this is where Chin Yang, Phil Morey, Mike McGinnis, uh, John Tiffany, and Howard Bader, um, you know, the list goes on of all these experts that put on these programs through Merck, Chad Region 3. And Richard Shaughnessy, had, when he was with Tulsa, he had three other regions. He had Henry uh, Slack's region, Region 4 in the southeast. He had the, uh, he had Barbara Spark, uh, she saw any PHS Region 1 in California, and then he had whatever his region, I think it was six in Texas, Oklahoma, all that. And they were the primary people that were putting on these programs and indoor air quality beginning of the mold, you know, the mold era. Was EPA sponsoring these? Or yes, yes. There was EPA money that basically went to those programs. Uh, okay. And the, audi the, audience was, the audience was basically a typical government audience that could be government employees, industrial hygienists, the property owners, managers, BOMA, the restoration or mediation okay. guys, indoor air quality guys, industrial hygienists. That was the audience, right? So we started showing up, some of these restoration guys who were – more than, you know, pioneering in the early days. And so what happened was, is during that time we went to this legal symposium, this is when we first met and listened to Eckerd Johanning. And Eckerd Johanning had just come off the, the primetime uh, interview with Melinda Ballard, and he was the occupational physician, you know, with the whole Melinda Ballard case, which basically changed the industry. And from there we developed a relationship with him. Uh, uh, he uh, spoke in some of our programs, Bill Morey. I mean, the list just goes on of all these guys who came to our programs and helped participate in some way in the standards and the committees. And I think it's important that the industry and the people who weren't around in those days know and understand where we came from, who we are, why we're here today. It didn't just happen by accident. And there, and there's, 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 there should be a certain amount of reverence and respect that's paid for that for those days, not to dwell on it, but to learn from those lessons, understand it, and then decide, so how do we make it better today? How do we move to the future? How do we get back to some of the stuff that we did, build the industry, that somehow we've gotten off track? All right. I like it. Okay. What about, you, you kind of hit the mark in early yeah. Willie days. So let's move to the, the WLI 1 and 2, Oakland and Pittsburgh. What, what's Pete, where's the Western Pin <laughs> Preserve for the CMPs? What's that mean? Yeah. So look, this is what happened. So during all these days with Merck and we met a lot of these guys, we decided to put together the, 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 the early, it was part of the plan for the WLI when the association approved as the World Health Institute. We had to do a conference and we also had to do a certification program. That comes in a few minutes a little later. So what happened is the very first program, there were some issues in the association with a bunch of stuff going on. And back in those days, the councils or the committees, we called them advisory committees, not councils. They had budgets, they had different authorities. They were institutes, I call it. The later was institutes. Well, it was an institute, but the committee was an advisory committee that served the institute. Yes, correct. Uh, okay. That's right. So what happened is we, gen we put these conferences on and generated as much money as the annual conference. I mean, it, it was powerful. And, um, and so what happened is the, we had the first one was in the Oakland, Berkeley Hills. We essentially basically we took a five-star hotel where they used to have some of the local insurance meetings. We contracted with the hotel, we filled the hotel up, we took the hotel over, and we had an unbelievable event that just kicked off. There were 300 people that came, which you had never seen before. It's just kind of a regional kind of a deal. You know, it was a national, but just, you know, outside of the annual convention. And, um, and so uh, that's when we first met Mac Pierce, and uh, he's quite a character. But what, but, but what happened is, after that, when we went to, to year two, we wound up being in Pittsburgh, and... and um, we picked the Westin in downtown, which is a grand old hotel. It's got Starbucks in there, the whole nine yards, and there's a Kinko's real close. And what happened is we had some turbulence that was going on through changes in management at RAA, and, or ASCR was, and, and within the WLI. So since it was in Pittsburgh locally, and I had a couple trips out there with Cliff. Remember, I was living in California, but I traveled a lot. Okay. What happened was is we decided to, due to the negotiating with the hotel and then the staff, signed off on the contract, and we had the deal. But, and I be, basically became the primary contact. The CMP is a certified meeting planner who basically oh, organized all this okay. stuff, right? Okay. So what happened is 
I actually, me and Cliff uh, kind of organized the entire event. And what happened is, why is that important? Well, back in those days, really in any days, why did volunteers get so committed and get so passionate? Because their name's associated with it. Who, who wants to have something be a flop, right? So we, we wanted to have be successful. And we had an unbelievable committee of 10 or 12 guys. They pitched in, volunteered, and the committee basically delivered the show. I'm not going to get into all the politics of the association in time, but let's just say this. What happens when you have a show and you have to meet at a hotel, they have a little pin that they give to the, to, to, to the VIP, whoever is heading up the meeting planner, to work with the hotel. I had to sit in a room with 15 people at the Western staff that would have been by the person who handed the show to organize and, and put this event off, and it was unbelievable. The event was great. Um, the handout, we started the handouts before we went into the digital age. At one particular point, I actually had an AS, I had a Kinko's credit card from ASCR in my name. And what Cliff and myself, we, what we wanted to give the members back then for was digital. We wanted to give them a workbook, meaningful handouts. It was unbelievable. I mean, we no. spent some money at Kinko's. But we did it We did it on behalf of the members. No, but it was mandatory because when someone sent some, uh, one of their employees cross-country to right. attend this, like, what are they bringing back? And, yeah. and, and we yeah. wanted it to be... Noteworthy, impressive, yeah. and valuable. So let me wrap up with that. There's this guy there named Dr. Miner, and Dr. Miner is out of Texas, and he's mm. the guy. He, he's the guy that un, uh, that microband hired. Um, then there's a lot of guys like him who would do testing of products to get EPA registration. So we wanted him because these were when some of those fifth issues were on the industry. We wanted him to talk to the members and talk to the industry about what the process is, what does EPA registration mean, what's the difference, all that kind of stuff. So he kind of gave us his talk, and he, he happened to be an entertaining guy. At one particular point, he ended by saying this. He goes, look, he says, you guys don't need to make it too complicated. He says, it's this simple. He says, the first thing that you need to do is you need to clean it. The second thing you need to do is you need to dry it. The third thing that you need to do is you need to apply, apply the registered disinfectant. And the fourth thing you need to do is send in a bill. So, <laughs> so, and it was in that order because he said all disinfectants, we're based on a clean surface, okay? Yep. So yep. he said, clean it first. He said, then you actually dry it before you apply the product to get maximum efficacy, all right? And then he said, the job's done. If you did your job right, send in a bill. And so that was it. So it was clean it, dry it, sanitize it, send in a bill. It was like the battle cry. And it went on for quite a while. And to this day, is it any different? Should it be? Joe, you're and I, you're, I mean, is it different? No, I, you know, it's, it's that simple. Although there is the battle on whether to sanitize. Well, but that's true, know. but but the point is we, we kind of get away from this. We make it too complicated sometimes. So that's the point. I agree. I agree. All right. Let's go to, uh, we're starting to get, I think, a little closer to yeah. the current time here. Consigli and the Purdue Connection. That's an interesting topic. Uh, we were at the, we did a couple shows actually now from Purdue. At the uh, at the conference, or at least one, and we've done uh, one call in, I believe. Wait, we did with Randy Rapp. Randy Rapp, yeah, yeah. So, so what happens? There's a guy named Bob Bonwell who really uh, should uh, have uh, um, the, the industry owes so much to him. And so, what happened is uh, Bob Bonwell uh, as a, uh, a company advantage marketing, and his, uh, his, his kids are in the business now. And uh, based out of Indianapolis, I think he has an office in Cincinnati. Okay. And he's okay. a you know, traditional su supplier. He's Fine. probably part of the, the Interlink Bridgepoint Network. Anyway, um, so he had a whole focus group of guys, guys like Dan Posky. He's the guy who started um, uh, the IMAC right. group. He had a guy named, well, he had Kurt Bolden, who everybody knows in the Lab. He had Chuck DeWall, everybody knows Chuck in his. And a number of other guys like this, DTI guys, RIA members, uh, all these guys. Joey Pickett, and the, even he was an ISRC instructor. He also was a um, he was a, uh, a, a okay. cleaner in the area. Uh, Jim Rochelle, who started Evans in the garment. Well, these guys were in their focus group back in those days in the nineties, and they were all complaining one time when they got together that they couldn't find employees. And so Bob said, he said, well, you know, my cousin is a dean at, at Purdue over the building construction, he says, why don't I go up and talk to him and find out whether he can solve our problem? Well, that basically led to a trip up there. At one point in the 90s, uh, me and Joey Pickett, I was part of that group. We went up. This is when Drew Brees was the quarterback there many, many years ago. And um, we started talking to building construction, talking to the department. And after a couple of business, they said, you know what? We can help you. I said, but it takes money. And they walked us around the campus, and they showed all the concentrations on the building instruction, how industry helped fund these buildings and hire professors. So Bob went out 
took him a while, and he had to he had to raise a million and a half dollars. They have matching fund, funders there, so it's a three million dollar fund. And he so what he decided he wanted to get uh, ten. ten entities entities that would be willing to commit one hundred fifty thousand, which is fifteen thousand a year for ten okay. years. And so uh, Unsmoke jumped on board, and um, Dryer Dry Dry. jumped on board. Kempspec jumped on board. All three of them now are all under the Legends brand. You know, mm-hmm. um, yep. DKI did. Service Master, Evans, IMAC, um, I think Bridgepoint too. You know, if I left someone out, I apologize. But they basically had nine companies, and he had a certain window of time. And if he lost that window, what would happen is the money would go. The money would go away, and the program would fall. The matching money. Would the matching. Go away. Right. So what he did is. At this, at Claude had sold dryers now. He went to Claude personally, and he, he asked Claude if Claude would give the money. I think Bob might have even donated. No, no. Oh, yes, Bob was Advantage Marketing donated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How can I forget? How right. can I forget that? Yeah. Right. And I, he did come to ASCR and IACRC, but we told him the industry, the nonprofits can't do that. The, our members do. And basically, all those people are members yeah, and, right. you know, and trainers for ISRC. Yeah. Right. Right. So what happened was he went to Claude, and he was, he was desperate. And Claude didn't really know anything about Purdue or anything, but he cared about Bob. Bob was a major supplier for him, sold a lot of his products, very loyal as a friend. He was an honest broker. He was a pioneer. He, he was the first guy with the cube trucks that's right. standard today and all that. And Ray Drove bought the first cube truck. Bought the first cube truck. And what happened was he gave him the money. And that's why it launched. He personally donated 150000 So what happened was a few years later, I asked Claude, why did he do it? And... Uh, he didn't care anything about Purdue. He didn't even know about it. He said, because Bob helped me and I helped him. That was it. Yeah. People don't realize these things that happen, why we are where we are today, because it's the commitment of people to the industry about giving back. It's a two-way street. And because of that, there's a program, and the industry is down the road to, to credibility and, and to credentials one day. Yep. It's because... Because all those companies supported it, and when push came to shove, one man personally supported it because the way he felt for another man. We should never forget that. Well, you know, the amazing thing is all they, it, I think what, what's important is it was critical that Claude went in because everyone else had already given, you know, Purdue had the money. They had the money. They had, I mean, if they had the money the and pledge. they had the pledge. You know, we we had this. I mean, Purdue's legal department wrote the documents that. Well, you know, trust me, we were committed. Without that last, we would have lost. Us. We would have lost all the money, and we were still committed. Yeah. Well, and and what happened is, you know, if you look at that now, in in 2007, at one of the one of the uh, fall conferences of RAA, we had uh, we had Robert Cox, who was the uh, was the, the, the head of Cox. he was the, the Dean Cox, he was the head at the time. Of uh, in that BCM area, um, he came and uh, we had a program. We put him on a program to talk about the restoration project management of the future. They hadn't hired Randy yet. Then they hired Randy. That we introduced him to the industry in Baltimore to RA conference, and he introduced Randy. And then you know it's been really great relationships since. Randy now is on the ISCRC board. Yep. Um, you know I go out to do regularly, do guest lectures there, as do some of the other people that help out. We've had uh, Dale Saylor, who was the was the uh, CEO of DKI, did a lecture. Um, uh, uh, Sheldon Yeldon from Belfort did a, a guest lecture to all the students and the faculty. It was very well received. The undercover boss, they loved that. <laughs> um, uh, recently, uh, Paul Gross who's, and uh, Wayne Sarah, who's Wayne Sarah is the, the new CEO of Code Blue, they went and gave the insurance TPA perspective you know, to the audience. I always kind of said, I said, if we can't get those guys to come out of disaster programs to actually work for restoration contractors, the next best thing would be insurance adjusters. And some of them do go to Liberty Mutual and go to the company. So this is important. And the culmination last year is Purdue Purdue had a global conference and reached out to me and industry. The ISRC supported it. Um, Ed Jones from Code Blue wrote a paper that was scientifically peer-reviewed on the flood research work that they do in their house. And I got Cliff and Rusty to work with the two, with the demolition industry and two, two well-known respected demo guys and uh, a lady from the volunteer sector uh, industry. Uh, you know, they travel around the world cleaning up after these tsunamis. Yep. We wrote a 20-page document. It's published on the Purdue ePubs. It's globally downloaded. And we just talked about best practices to, to the academic audience, to, the, to the, uh, the seven countries represented there, to government. There was people there who represent the World Health Organization, 
the CDC, the one guy talked about the Haiti reform, yeah. one lady talked about the, the, earth, the, 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 the Christchurch earthquakes in New Zealand, and so the members stepped up, and we basically were able, through these connections, we were influencing the global impact of this, and people don't realize that. In some ways, you know what I'm saying, it could even have more potential impact than maybe these standards do, because you have the leaders in the industry who are essentially saying, this is what happens in real life in the field. And it was simple and readable. And um, anyway, and, I, and those guys put a lot of work at their own time, their own expense. They came, and, and I really. I think before that. you go on, I think one thing, Pete, is is we're graduating people out of those programs now. Well, that's true. They they have they have a, uh, a work study group of Purdue students that have been coming to REA for quite a few years. People are graduating. Uh, they're getting internships in the industry, working in summer jobs to get to help get their degrees. Um, the Boldens and some of the other schools are, are, are subsidizing them, you know, for uh, incidental fees to cover hard costs. Yep. They're taking IHRC courses, and they're being hired in the industry, and, that, and that's starting to grow, and that's important, and that's part of a credentialing and part of an industry having credibility, in my, in my view. Well, you, you mentioned the IICRC a few times. You, you two served together um, on the IICRC board in the mid to late 90s. Can we talk yeah. about that? Just well, you know, I, I served from 1994. To 1999, and there, there were four individual shareholders of the ISRC when Ed York turned all that over several years ago, and um, and that was uh, the two Paulson brothers, uh, Rodney and Daryl uh, Lee Pemberton, right here in Pittsburgh, and it was Tom Hill who just recently retired as uh, their their, uh, their director for many years, uh, manager, you know, management firm. And um, at the time when Tom came in to, he gave his shares back once he was going to become the director. From Ken Lee Mead, who was the original director, because it was a conflict. And, but he had many years. He had Cy Gantz at the seat from uh, Dupont, who was great. Cy, really tremendous input. And um, and so um, uh, Rodney came to me and Daryl actually, and they said, "Pete, how would you like to um, uh, sit in Rodney's seat, you know, for a few years and um, get some input?" And I said, "Well, I hadn't thought about it. I, what do you want me to do?" Well, he said, "Well, we just want to repeat." He said, what do you want back? He said, well, we don't really want anything. You know, we're not going to tell you that. We'll do whatever you want. He said, but you know, once you walk here in Southern California, if you want to stop by and you know, talk to us and do a little training. He said, well, I'd do that anyway. You're my friend. You're at the center. Anyway, that's how it started. I had that seat for four years. Cliff was on there representing Tri-State for many years. Claudia was there representing ASCR. And, um, you know, those were the early years of development. And, and through the time that I served at the, there, actually, in the early 90s, uh, when I was working for Dry's, I became the WRT TAC. Claude was the TAC. And then I, I took it over. Okay. And so I was, I was an ISR as an instructor, you know, I did all that. And so what happened was, is I, I actually, um, uh, there's a couple of major things that I did while I was involved with the ISCS at that level, being on the board. The first thing is I had, I had the opportunity at the time to be involved with a group of people that developed the conflict of interest policy, you know, that still stands today. Working with Mark Hansen, their prior uh, uh, attorney who passed, uh, was a wonderful man. He helped a lot with a lot of policies, a lot of standards he was involved. He was terrific and a good risk management mind. And um, there also was an instructor's, original instructor's committee, me, Mike West, Lee Pemberton, Doug Bowles. Um, we worked with how to establish CCs for instructors. And I always felt, I, I said, and I, I was agreed, we said, look, as instructors, we need to have, have a higher CC requirement than the students and the certificates. I said, you have to have a higher passing score to teach. So I said, we thought it should be in three areas. And this was led to the, to the instructors of Bowling Dry uh, that uh, not Dry, the ISRC has. We said, look, there's three things. They need to have technical expertise in the area they're teaching. They need to have some level of hands-on experience, right? It's not just academic. And then they need to have professional skills of just being good trainers and how to present. And that ultimately became, we used to call it then, not CCs, we call it PDUs, Professional Development Units. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but I was very happy to work with that in that, that role, and um, I thought those were important things. And then, of course, you know, the development of the standards process and eventually to the, you know, to the ANSI process. Cliff and myself were always advocates for that. So that's no, I got those the ANSI process. Yeah. Uh, Cliff, did you want to add anything in that, at that point? Those were some pretty turbulent uh, times. And I think there was a reason why the conflict of interest policy uh, needed to be pushed there and, and pushed hard because there were blatant uh, oh. major conflicts of interest. Major conflicts. All and, right. I, and I think that that document uh, went far in correcting them. All right. Let's move to the, uh, the Z-Man. You were in the room, actually. Um, apparently when the ASCR left the IICRC. What, what happened? I think, first of all, I think, um, as you know, Joe, the uh, 
the IACRC uh, is their shareholders, and there are different regional associations that are shareholders. And I think that there are regional associations, and then there are regional associations that think that they're international associations. And in all honesty, uh, I think that there were some people that were uncomfortable that RIA joined. And I'll be very honest with you, I was. Uh, RIA had joined many years before. I was very disappointed that RIA or that uh, RIA had, had joined. It was ASDR at that time. I felt that uh, really IICRC had proven themselves to uh, really uh, you know, be the enemy of, uh, of ASCR in, in, in many, many ways. And they just didn't have an open process. It was kind of their way or the highway, and I think it was very inclusive. And, uh, you know, uh, so what? No, ex you meant exclusive or inclusive? You said inclusive. No, ex. Yeah, you know, that they were not inclusive. Right. You no. said it, you meant exclusive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That they were not inclusive. Yeah. ICRC was always, I don't know, trying to. I, I was there as a representative. I was there to represent Tri-State. And and what happened was they had this bigger picture. So when you went to the IICRC, you were supposed to take off your Tri-State hat and then put on the IICRC hat. And, and vote for things that supported the IICRC. You, you had this like built-in conflict of interest. Is this best for my for my regional, or is this best for the association? Yeah. And you're always mm -hmm. supposed to vote for what was best for the association. So for the organization, not the, or, the organization, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So, so what they did is they changed this loyalty pledge. And in my opinion, the, the change in the loyalty pledge was directly uh, pointed towards. Uh, RIA, okay. ASCR at that time, or RIA today. And what happened was the pre the president of I was past president, uh, immediate past president of uh, of RIA, and I got along really well with Lee Zimmerman, who was president of uh, IICRC, because we were both from from Western Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill Warren, uh, who was my vice president, and then was president of RA. He's, uh, he's a good guy, he's a real strong religious person, and he could not, a person of very high principles, he refused to sign a document and then do something different. And he said, I'm not going to sign this document. And at that point, uh, RA was represented by Larry Jacobson, who uh, was an attorney. And RIA had, or we were we were managed by it. Larry yeah, was the executive director. Correct. He was the, the executive director. He was an attorney, and Mark Hansen was an attorney, and they were trying to come up with some sort of uh, language, and it, it boiled down to IICRC being unwilling to change the language, and uh, ASCR now RIA being unwilling to live with the language, so they just sold their shares back. You know, it's a it's a tough situation. I'm on there now. Yeah, I know. You know, you, you've got that inherent conflict between your regional and... But then, it, to, but then Joe, it was much, much worse. They, they had all these regulations that... Uh, now, now IICRC has come so far in terms of collaboration. You know, they're trying to collaborate with RIA. They're trying to collaborate with IAQA. They're trying to... Really, at really, that point, there was no collaboration. Uh, everyone... They looked at everyone as the enemy, and everyone was the competitor, and whatever anyone else was doing, they also wanted to do. And they really, uh, it was a tough time. All right, well, let's, let's move to the next topic here. Um, summer camp, oh, what a great topic. Right around the corner, summer camp, years one through three, the executive chef was born. We've got him here, Pete. Yeah. So what happened was, we met Joe Seabrook and Matt Pierce, a lot of these guys, um, during those Willie Ambassador years, me and Cliff out there, the legal symposium, all the stuff we talked about. And um, and Joe was just fantastic, uh, you know, and and back then, uh, WLI hosted the two building science seminars with Joe, very educational for our members. So what happened was, is he came up with this idea for summer camp, and the original idea was is that he was going to um, – uh, he wanted to put training on by what he calls the old guys who know stuff, you know, who are his leaders and mentors in the building science community, to train his own guys and his very close friends. So, actually, the very, very first summer camp, which is not registered as part of summer camp, and I wasn't really part of it, he did. He had one of these kind of events. 
And what he realized is there was only 10, 15 people there. They threw some money in the pot. They had some talk. They bought some pieces. They drank some beer. You know, it was one of those deals for a few days. He realized he wanted to be more significant. So what he did is he started reaching out to people that he knew and all the different components of the building science community, the industrial hygienists, the home builders, the engineers, the architects, all this kind of stuff, and all the relations they had, and, and me and Cliff were the restoration guys. So he invited two people from each of these industries. It was supposed to be like 40 people that had come to the first recorded summer camp, I think, in 1996. And um, so what happened was they wanted to be in about 60 that came. And that very first one, um, I actually did a cameo. I, I, in, in year one, I did a cameo on a case study of a mold remediation project that I did underneath the crawl space. doesn't seem like that's much now, but back then in the pre-mold, that was a big deal. And insurance covered it all back then. It was very interesting. Okay. And what happened is, and that was that, and there's some stuff we could talk about. But anyway, that was the first one. It was intense detail. In year two when we come back, um, what happens is uh, the thing, it was a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the very early one. It actually went to Thursday. But on the Sunday before, sometimes on a Saturday night, people start coming in to Joe's house. They're going over to barbecue in his house. So Joe's out there. He's barbecuing, he's got a beer, he's talking with a bunch of his friends and everything. And I'm watching the grills flaring up, the black is rolling <laughs> off, you know. So I, I get there, it's about noon, and I'm looking at in his back porch, I'm looking at him. And he's, hey, how you doing, Joe? And I'm just standing there kind of shaking my head at him. He goes, what's going on? I said, Joe, you're kind of sucking at this. What do you, what, what do you mean? I said, well, you can't be drinking, cooking, and talking at the same time. You know, they're like separate deals. Now, these guys didn't kind of know that I was, you know, I'm a dying kid raised in New York, cooking with my grandmother, my mother, my aunts, my cousins. So he said, so what, you could do better? I said, better. I said, I could kick your ass standing on my head with one hand tied behind my back. And I, those might have been my actual words. <laughs> so now everyone's kind of really quiet. So Joe kind of looks at me. Now he starts walking towards me with this gleam in his eye. He reaches in his pocket. He gives me his credit card. He says, you're in charge. I said, what does that mean? He says, go ahead. You're talking? He says, impressive. So said, well, do I have a budget? He says, no. He says, do whatever you want. I said, no budget? Uh, it's my kind of party, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and years later, you know, he kind of got me back. He said, you know, Kinsey was the only guy I know who has no budget and he can exceed it. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, that ought to be laughing so hard there, Mr. Z. So anyway, I go out, and about four hours later, I put this feet on, and, and, it, and it was a big deal. And they didn't know I was a cook. So they're going, Pete, you whipped this together so quick. What's the deal? I said, look. It's not because I'm a cook. I said, I'm a restoration project manager. The guy's had an emergency. This is what we did. I the boy. So he said, you know, if you actually had some time, what you did, if you have some time, I said, I'll give you a Sicilian feast. I said, that's like Thanksgiving on steroids is what I told him. They go, great. So Tuesday night, I did my first Sicilian night. That was the beginning of Sicilian night. I made all my family recipes and hit. And after that, for year three, he said, hey, Pete, if we want to take over summer camp, that part, the social activity, which I did, and the rest is history. But year three, I actually did another um, cameo. This was actually a very important cameo. Uh, I had worked with the, one of our members, and I've been, been doing some consulting, uh, Richard and Dan Chavez, the Chavez brothers out, out of uh, Topeka, New Orleans, Kansas. And they had had a major flood in a high school. It was a vandalism. It was on the local news. And they called me, and I consulted with them on doing the drying of the building. And so they, they, they dried these hardwood floors out, and they said they could be done. And for about forty-five or 50000 they saved the county over 200000 maybe 250. And what happened is in the second dry symposium, I helped Dan put a present to case study, and he presented it to the dry symposium. Years after that, we actually did that case study in some of the training classes of dry that we did. And we were able to share back with the industry how the technology works, vapor pressure differential, giant dense materials, all that. Well, I gave that presentation to the summer camp audience, and I got to tell you, I was nervous as you could possibly be. Now, by this time, there's like 125 people there from the 50, and I give the presentation, I say, and then what I told them, I said, this is what we had, this is what we did, this is what turned out. I didn't try to explain the science or do anything. I just said, these are the results, this is real. So they enjoyed it. One guy way in the back of the room says, well, you know, Pete, so... A job is fairly recent, but yeah. He goes, so, you know, you got to sit in the edge of your seat for a while. I said, yeah, I said, we got to go through four seasons, you know, we'll make sure. Anyway, anyway, it went through the warranty period. Everything was great. It worked out fine, and that was it. So it's stuff like that. This is what association is about, people networking, sharing information. That was summer camp, and anyway, it's legendary. Now this year, it's going to be the 19th year. Next year is our 20th anniversary. Uh, all right, eight. we'll go there. Um, we're up to about 500 now. Well, 400 plus, and with the crew and everything, and Monday night is about 500. And, and quite frankly, 
And then my mom was involved for many years with the Sicilian night. We had a real Sicilian mom in the kitchen. And after she passed, we named it the Vita Consigli Memorial Sicilian Night. And about 100 people stay. And I, some of my cousins come up and we prepare our recipes. And it's a lot of fun. And um, so next year is a big year. 20th anniversary of summer camp. 70th anniversary of uh, REA. Yeah. You know, and the sale is done. Be a big year for some things are resilient. Yeah, well, they are resilient. Yeah. All right, what about what's the WLS? Well, the, the WLS is the Water Law Specialist Program. You know, RAA has the Certified Restorer, which Marty founded. We had several programs uh, through the divisional days. We had um, the, the uh, uh, Armin Buzz Jr., Bill Hanian, and Ellen Amerkin developed the CRS Certified Rec Specialist. It was a special fabric specialist course that Stephen Steenback had developed for the Coffin of Pulse Keeners years ago. Uh, Davis Warfield was well known in the air quality group. Uh, he did this as uh, certified mechanical hygienist. And then the WLS was a specialty designation in the water loss area, which, quite frankly, that was part of the original uh, WLI concept that when we said we were going to put conferences on the Goodwill Ambassador, certain things in the WLS. So we, we put that together, Cliff, myself, uh, two other gentlemen, and um, we uh, developed that program in the late 1990s, 1999. We rolled it out in Kansas City. And uh, it's evolved, and it's out to this year. It's been redeveloped a couple times over the year, but it's um, you know it's a it's a specialty. Uh, you know, it's it, it's as close to being a third party accreditation without actually being one. Because when we actually develop it, we develop it for for the association to own it through consensus based process, trying to follow the rules of third party accreditation. I see. So, yeah. All right. What about your what, what was your three year walk? Uh, well, it, so as soon as the WL, WLS was uh, done. And I felt I completed that work. In the mid-90s, I started thinking about wanting to take some time off and take, and tr and take a trip around the world. I wasn't going to take two years off. I wound up being three because in the middle of my trip, 9-11 happened. And so what happened was is I, um, I wound up taking off from uh, October of, of 2000 until I came back to the industry in 2003. And I, and I traveled around the world. I was in the Dominican Republic. Uh, I had a separate trip to Europe. I, I did a lot of things, and I, it was just my own personal thing. I literally dropped out of the industry. didn't talk to anyone, really, for over a year and a half, almost two years. And and I almost didn't come back to the industry. I got so burned out in the politics that stepped up in the late 90s with the second S-500 document. I really burned out. I, I did a couple things I'm, I'm not very proud of, and um, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. And Came back for summer camp every year? Yeah, I always did. Joe always told me, he said, we'll hunt you down wherever in the world. So don't worry, I'm back summer camp every year. But I did, I, you know, there's some stuff that happened. And um, anyway, so what happened was is I, uh, I basically, um, during that time, uh, almost was looking into becoming a professional chef. And I decided not to. And um, anyway... In 2002, I came back for, they called me to come back to do something with one of the WLI conferences. And anyway, a year later, I came back to the industry. And um, anyway, and here I am. But I almost said, you know, what I realized is I didn't want to be a professional chef. And, you know, I had an opportunity in 1978 with uh, some friends of mine who wanted to send me to culinary art school in, in uh, France. If I made a 10-year commitment to them, they were going to open up a, a, a four-star restaurant in New York. And some people say that. I would if, if I would I would have never I wouldn't have been known in the industry then, and a lot of people who know me said Pete if you would have put that level in then, you would have been Emerald Bobby Flay I could have been one of those guys that would have been my oh, yeah. but what happened is it never wound up being it I became the restoration guy and I feel that I get that part that I want Joe gave that to me to be the executive chef yeah that's good that's good and it's and, and you you love it it's obvious all right. Where, where's what's the birth of the restoration watch? Yeah. Come on, what's the restoration? Yeah, so anyway, so during during the uh, my sabbatical, there became a point where around the time just before I came back, I kind of reconnected with Cliff. This was a year before he came back, and I found out that that the ISCRC had started process to develop the S520, and. Um, so the question I asked was, I said, well, are they, are they following their, their, their rules? And everybody says, what rules? I said, well, one of the things that we did for the second S-500 and before uh, I left, we developed, the ISRC developed a document that was called um, the ISRC standard for, for, for creating and maintaining standards. It was a seven-page document, one-page application, six-page that was based on ANSI essentials. And Claude shared the committee. I mean, the committee was Claude Cliff. Barry Costa, Dane Bernazzani, um, um, uh, uh, Dane Gregory, 
and the larger committees with Bishop and um, and Larry Cooper, I think they're a false. And, and so what happened was we developed a document before we did the second S-500, and I think they used it for the S-300 too, which was their posted document, to just, we weren't ANSI yet, but we wanted to follow ANSI rules because the second S-500, Cliff and myself had suggested that they needed somebody to be a better writer, so we actually recommended Glenn Feldman, and he, 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 the document looked better. If you ever look at the first and the second, the first one just kind of looked amateurish. The second one looked ANSI style. was much better than the second document. So during that time, everyone started saying like they didn't know what I was talking about, and that it didn't exist. So I, I kind of got a little upset, and I started making a couple of calls around, and everyone said, we don't even know what you're talking about, Pete. I said, well, that's a bunch of BS. I said, quite frankly... That document, I was on the board. I presented that document on behalf of the consensus body at the time to the IIC Certification Council. It was approved by the board, I said, and it was IICRC policy. How could a bunch of guys develop it and not even recognize it exists anymore? Well, what Including I was, some of the people that developed it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what, what, I, what I was told later was, and this is just aggravates me, so I'm going to go out in the edge here. So if I ruffle a few feathers, so be it. What happened was is people told me that well, maybe it was a mistake and it didn't get put in the policy after it was approved. I said, so how did that happen? They, they wanted to blame Kenway me because he wasn't around anymore. What BS that is. I said, look, Kenway was a wonderful man. He did a great job. Nah, I'm not buying it. And that was it. So Cliff and myself trademarked the name Restoration Watchdogs, and that was the beginning of the watchdogs. With John, John Downey was the original watchdog. Well, Ed York was the original watchdog, and I did a lot of writing in the early years with Downey when he was the owner of Clean Fact before he sold it. Okay. And we just had a connection through Ed, Ed York and with Downey and me and Cliff, and we just wanted to do the right thing, and we raised an awareness for the industry. We did our own mailings. We created a logo, and we challenged the industry, and quite frankly, we raised, we, we ruffled a lot of feathers, and we created a stir. Ultimately, what that led to, the ISRC then had Mark Hansen, their attorney, develop a 38-page uh, document that is their document on how to develop standards, and eventually it became an ANSI standard provider, and that, that's yeah, yeah. That's how it happened. You know what I always like to say? I like to quote Mark Twain here. And he, anyone who's listening, anybody who's going to read the blog, and anyone who's not the bitch and complain, Mark Twain once said, "Get your facts straight first, sir, before you try to distort them." <laughs> and uh, any place, any time, Pete and I will be willing to put our credentials on the line, our voting record, and. And our, prof and our integrity and our professional reputation on the line. Absolutely. You tell us where, we'll, sh we'll be there. Right. I love it. All right. The WLI, Goodwill Ambassador, and the Standards Consultant play a game of chicken. Yeah, so let me tell you about it. So, so, so this, is, this is why I, so what happened is I'm on, I'm on my sabbatical. The Restoration Watch, I remember I told you I visited with Cliff. We did a mail and we created a bunch of stuff. So at the time, the, consult the, the Standards Consultant for the IACRC had taken a sabbatical, and uh, not a sabbatical. He, he took a trip with his wife. I think he, I don't remember where he went. He went to... Um, Hilton Point. No, 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 no. He, no, he went, he went, no, no. He went, he went to, like, Nepal, and I don't know whether he went to Everest, but he took off, and he was off the, the radar for at least a month, not checking email, not checking voicemail, not doing anything. Well, apparently when he came back, what he told me later, we laughed about it, he said... Uh, he had so many emails and so many voices. Everything was fogged up, and it was all about, you know, what's Consigli and Plotnik doing and these guys with this restoration watchdog. So he calls the powers to be at ASCR, the president at the time, and he says, well, so where's Pete? He says, we don't know. He's around the world somewhere. He said, well, you've got to track him down, and, and you've, got to, you've got to call the dogs off, right? So I said, what are you talking You know, what's going on? So anyway, what happened is I get a message from the president at the time, and they said, Pete, I said, look, we just wrote a letter and sent a letter out, and, and I'm off. We're doing it. He says, yeah, but he says, the implications of that is you created a big stir. I said, well, it was designed to be. You know, we just wanted to do the right thing. So he goes, he says, look, can you call a standards consultant? He says, uh, he wants to talk to you. So I remember I was in Greece, and I'm up in the second city called Pelicaniki. That's where Philip of Macedonia is from. And I'm, and I'm up there, and I'm, 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 uh, I'm, uh, um, I'm, I'm during, during the, the, uh, the Greek Orthodox, uh, you know, deal, the whole country shuts down. Hey, okay, so anyway, so I call. I had to track them down. They're getting ready to, I think it was a dry symposium that was at the Mirage in Vegas. They had moved it then there. I don't know, it was a dry symposium somewhere. I'm pretty sure it was. It was a big deal. 
And I call, and I actually happen to get him while he's checking into the hotel, and he basically says, well, what do you guys got planned for me next, you know? <laughs> and I said, well, look, anyway. So the bottom line, what happened was is um, he basically, he, I said, you ready to cry, uncle? He says, man, you guys got to take it easy. And it was kind of funny. And it was really in jokingly in good nature with good intent. And um, after that, they, you know, they, they went down the road to develop the answer to do that. And we just, that was it. And, uh, but anyway. Right. It was funny. We um, we reminisced about it years later at an ACJH uh, meeting, and we talked about it, and um, yeah, it was what it was. You know, it's just it's part of the process, I guess. Well, all right. What about the Z Man becomes president? It's lonely at the top. Well, I, I I think that um, you know every business really needs to go through a uh, SWOT analysis. You know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. Uh, and threats, and uh, you know, when I was president of uh, RIA, I perceived the threat and felt that um, you know I needed to deal with it, and uh, I did the best I could to uh, you know to protect the association. And you know, sometimes that comes uh, by ruffling some feathers and uh, you know doing what you have to do. It's not always easy. What's the lesson learned there? Sometimes you just have to do what you're doing, take right. shots. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, I think the lesson is leadership. Leadership to make so so it's like you got to make hard decisions. You got to talk to the board. You got to get consensus. The board has to agree it's the right thing to do, and then the leader has to basically pull the plug or press the button or whatever it is. And, and, it, and it's there's always there's always cause and effect. Joe, you know, the, the one thing is uh, when you're the leader. You have to be willing to fall on the sword and uh, you know take yourself out. Or you know, it's not about politics; it's really about you know dealing with the threat. So, Joe, listen. I want to jump in here for a minute. Go ahead. Um, uh, we've got a lot to talk about, and I guess this is a three-hour show. So, this is what I'm going to suggest, and this is what we we'll do because I'm paying attention to the clock. What I think I want to do is I want to cover a couple more topics, and then I want us to roll into the roundup. Okay, right. and I made a note on our punch list, and I think at some point let's let this percolate for a while, and we're gonna have we're gonna have a part three to the show. Round it'll really three. be a part two, and this can be done. We don't have to be sitting together. Right, and we'll kind of continue down the list. All right. So I, I one of the things I think I'd, right. I'd like Cliff to comment on before we move back to a couple items of room in the roll up is talk about the ASCR Foundation because that kind of happened under your watch or when you were on the executive committee. Talk about that. That means what the C3 means and all that. That's kind of important. Just kind of try to cover it quickly. Well, fortunately, I didn't know anything about it when uh, RIA chose Larry Jacobson as the uh, association director. Uh, you know, RIA was always uh, professionally, I'm sorry, self-managed, and they chose him as the executive director. Prior to that, I mean, he was an attorney. Uh, he had worked for Service Master. <laughs> That was primarily why I think he ended up with the job, because he'd had experience in the industry. Um, what happened was his prior position, prior to coming to uh, ASCR, was he was um, involved with the building owners and managers association. And they have a very unique model at that group. There's the building owners and managers association, and they also have a complementary organization called the Building Owners and Manager, Managers Institute. So there is BOMA and BOMI. And what happens is there are certain limitations of things that a trade association can do, uh, which is primarily representing their members and, and so on and so forth. On the educational side, when it gets into certification, there are some limitations and there really need to be some walls set up between one and the other to go down the route of third-party accreditation. So I think that he had a, a really brilliant model, which was to have RIA have a C6, which dealt with um, association issues. And it's a uh, you know, IRS uh, C6, which is your normal trade association. And then there's what, what's called a 501C3, and the difference between the two of them is one is tax exempt and the other is not. So the C3 is tax exempt. It's the same type of uh, IRS um, 
category that universities such as Purdue and Penn State and uh, even church, and, and, even and, churches and, right, can fall and, and Educational charity to a serve chari- the great, charitable for the greater good. Yes, yeah. yeah. Charitable for the, for the greater good. And right now, after 9-11, they are very, very yeah. difficult to get. Tough to get. And they've got them. All right, right. let's go to uh, Cliff. Roasts Marty first. <laughs> Marty MC's <laughs> Z-Man's All right, so let me talk, let me talk about it. This is great. All right. So look, this is important. The reason I wanted Cliff to talk about the foundation, shortly after that, in 2004, we decided that we were going to roast, have a roast for Marty King, and we were going to use it to raise money for the foundation, right, for the ASR okay. Foundation. So what happened is we had the roast at the DuPont Country Club. We had this fellow, Bill Brown, who was a, a marketing consultant association at the time. He was connected. And so we, we, had, we had a conference in um, Philadelphia that year, and then uh, the, the, the Just, uh, uh, Just Contents Conference. And then what happened is we wound up having this, this, this uh, roast of Marty. So there was a whole slew of people that were going to roast Marty, and Cliff was one of them. What happened is Cliff got up there and did a real roast. I mean, you know, and he went out on the edge. And some people were kind of telling, well, Cliff, you know, you, you can't talk about that like Marty. I mean, he, was, he, he cracked some funny ones because everyone else, there wasn't a roast because they had this reverence for Marty, right? <laughs> so, so what happened is, he kind of ruffled, but he actually did a real roast, and it wasn't disrespectful in any way. It was just, it was, it was a roast, right? Uh, well, what, what happened was <laughs> they told me to, to, and this is like in Don Rickles and all these people yeah, exactly. on television, you know, that were doing it, and I, absolutely, I, I thought that that's what that they were. They right. told me that I was supposed to do it, and then they put us in alphabetical order, so I was last. <laughs> and what happens when you know, the first person gets up there and goes, okay, and you know, Marty's this, and, you know, and it's, it's like, it's like Marty, we are not worthy, <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so forth. And finally, they get to me, and I mean, and all the nice stuff had already been said. Yeah. <laughs> I had no other material. I had no choice, and as soon as I was done, the first person I saw was Jimmy Berry. Yeah. I need those boats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so what happened is that the next year in 2005, we had the, uh, the four conferences in St. Louis, and this was when a whole bunch of the Aussies came. Anyway, it's two weeks after Katrina, and it was funny, and that's also when Don Manger became, became was the first event that he showed up after we hired him, and he came after Jacobson, All right. right? And he's the guy who did the rebrand RN. So what happened was is um, – we thought we were going to lose a bunch of people because of Katrina, but we didn't. We only lost a few. And so one of those nights, we have a roast for Cliff, and now we make Marty the MC. But we had a big surprise for Cliff they didn't know. So Joe Jones was up there. I was there. Um, uh, Gary Spinieri. And, and anyway, so here's what the Harry. Show, uh, Harry, this is how we surprised Cliff. We reached out behind the scenes to Cliff's entire family, his, his mother, his father, his brothers, the whole deal. And we, of course, he didn't know anything about it, and they were going to be part of the roast. So what happens is we go through the traditional roast. Marty, Marty introduces me. This is what Marty says. He says, the next person I'm going to bring up to the stage has an uncanny ability to, at the most unopportune times, disclose the most embarrassing thing about you that you told him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, boy, it was just great. So, anyway, I said a couple of deals. So, anyway... Then and Billy Lakin did. Oh, oh Billy Lakin oh did this God. famous thing dressed as Tinkerbell, which was just hysterical, <laughs> you know. I mean, and, and the roast was fantastic. Anyway, just towards the end, Cliff, but everyone was. But this was no one said anything mean. This was like the Marty thing, you know. Yeah, like yeah. No one really well, we said some funny stuff. Yeah, anyway, so, what, so what happened is, so now Cliff, uh, Marty got a couple zingers in on him. Marty got a couple zingers. So now Cliff basically comes up, he does his thing, and then what happens is we bring his whole family. in. And he's just stunned. And then his brother Arnold and his brother Stu gave and just talked about the history. It was great. Then we took a family photo. It was fantastic. Right. It was really good. You know, there's one other thing I want to th- I, I want to talk about. Just as you know, when it was lonely to talk, you know, one of the most difficult decisions I just thought about this uh, was when I was president of RIA. We had an event scheduled in Canada when SARS broke out. Mm. And I, I remember it was a very difficult decision that I made to cancel that event. I mean, oh, uh, that's right. Do you remember? I mean, yeah. I, 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 you know, it's just kind of like... Not only that, we canceled, after 9-11, right. we canceled a major event. Right. Be, the same thing as right. nobody would fly. Yeah. So we, those yeah. are tough. And, and then, then there was very specific language 
after that that went into these contracts that talked about terrorism that had to do with attrition clauses and contract systems, you know, the world never hit based on it. Uh, yeah, the fine, and like, we don't even think about SARS anymore, but, yeah. you know, if I mention the bull, I think people will remember yeah, kind of like, kind of like, like what, the kind of like what we yeah. were dealing with. I mean, it was, it was a scary deal because yeah. that yeah. happened okay. right there. One more, I'm going into the One round. more. This All right. right. The RIA rebranding is announced on IAQ Radio. Yeah, so this, this right? is going to be a good way to finish up here, and then uh, we'll do a part two with some stuff. Absolutely. So what ha so what ha and I'll be back at the consigliere for that. So what right. happened is, um, REA, after Major comes in and whatever, and they do some strategic planning and, and uh, develop a, you know, a, a mission, and a, 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 the model is developed as part of the rebrand. We make it better. Uh, we promise it's on our website. And what happened was is, it was done as kind of a closed process, and it was intentionally done as a closed process. See, the ASCR rebrand was an open process because once AIDS, the real AIDS came out, we couldn't call it association AIDS, and we went through an open process. But for a variety of reasons, the board handled it, and quite frankly, even I didn't know about it. People said later, they said, if you guys did something that Consigli didn't know about, boy, that it was like, this is like the CIA. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Anyway, but towards the end, then when they became the consultancy association, did all that. What happened was, is um, they brought me into the process to help, and they wanted to know how we're going to introduce it to the industry for the first time. And IQ Radio was chosen, and that's when Don Manger, when you guys interviewed him, and this has really started the beginning of a long relationship between REA, IQ Radio through me, and you know, I thought it was a fact. It was like a 60 minutes interview. Don was prepared, he asked the questions, and that's how we released it. And then right after that, Patty Harmon, our communication director at the time, basically sent the news releases out to the industry, it went out, and just the whole industry, and that was it. And so that was it. You know, we'll we'll talk about the implications of that. Well, I will let me close with this at this point. What why did RIA do it? Well, what we realized is is we had done a bunch of surveys um, every five years with the planning, and we looked at the demographics of our membership. The carbon upholstery cleaner guys had left several years ago with the build up of connections in the ISARC, but the rugby's who are founding fathers were still there. And the demographics, shortly a year or two before this rebrand was decided to change to REA, we only had 7% of our members that even talked about doing kind of cleaning in the context of textiles. And most of them were the rug, you know, the rug cleaning, the carpet cleaning. We were restoration. 93% were restoration, and that was the decision. Anyway, when we moved past this, go down, you know, the next show. We'll talk about the implications of that, what came out of it, and really um, move us now very close to where we're at, and then, you know, talk about where I think, and Cliff and me, we'd like to share it with you. Hopefully we can do that. I don't know if we can do it in two weeks. Nah, we can do it. You know, whenever we're going to do it, we'll, we'll bring it back. Let this percolate for a while. Yeah. It is what it is. All right, right, I like that. Today's interview with the consigliere is over, but... Now returning in his role as the restoration industry watchdog, we still have Pete Consigli. We're going to wrap it up here today. We're going to take another five minutes of your time because I think this is great stuff. Pete, final words. Well, the um, I think I think you we, you probably ought to uh, follow follow this party. I kind of want to think. I want to kind of share something now. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, let's okay. Kind of yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about this a little yeah. bit. We're, 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 you know, we've talked a little bit about Pete's Mission Impossible here, all right? the, or the Mission Impossible vision, and a lot of select industry insiders are, you know, as a part of his efforts to facilitate collaboration between RIA and IICRC. Let's face it, they're the two big dogs, to unify the industry for the greater good of all its stakeholders. It's been received with mixed reviews. And because of special interests and, and other things, there's a bit of a fear of change in Pete's opinion. So, Pete, last word. Well, Mr. Phelps, your mission involves and will require leadership, team building, overcoming challenges, persistence, integrity, open-mindedness, inclusiveness, tolerance, patience. Transparency. Treating people with dignity and respect, creative collaboration, and finally reverence and honor for our history and our traditions. I do have, I have a, a, a vision for where I'd like to see the industry go in the social sector. How I'd like to see it unify. How I'd like to see the groups collaborate. And you know, before myself and Cliff and others of our generation retire, you know, um, how I'd like to 
see us pass it on to the next generation, the, the, the Gen Xers, the, the new young up and coming millennials. And uh, if the industry is willing to accept this mission, they're going to be rewarded, in my opinion, with 10 things and one really big one. And here they are. And this is the first time that I've actually ever shared this openly in public with the industry, and it's something that I, I, I asked Cliff to put in his blog. And I, later on throughout the year, I'll probably follow up with more thoughts um, in CNR Magazine and maybe some other, other venues. So here are the 10 bullet points. This is what I think the industry can have if they do these things, acting with those those core principles and values that I just talked about. I think they'll have a unified global voice so they can deal with issues and threats affecting the trade, the profession, and the business of cleaners and restorers. I think there'll be a place where in the one-tenth, the industry and all its stakeholders can meet twice a year to focus on ed education and growth. I think they'll have a vehicle to differentiate and disseminate best practices from technical and business issues that affect the profession. I think they'll have a means to partner with academia, government, the scientific community to validate the profession and the business of cleaning, restoration, remediation, reconstruction, inspection, and maintenance for the research, the quality control, the marketplace surveys. These only have meaning if we're able to do it together. I think the industry will have uh, own their own locations where practitioners of the trade can come to see and appreciate the industry's historical roots, understand where they came from by paying respect to the founding fathers and the trailblazers who toiled, toiled the fertile soil. I think the industry will have assurance and they will have confidence that they want to have with the customers of the products and service the industry provides that improves the quality of life and gives a peace of mind to those who require these products and services. In other words, the general public, the insurance industry, property managers, etc. That's what we want. We want to have assurance, we want confidence, and, and we want them to recognize us because we're credentialed for professional industry. We have research to validate the claims that we make. We can only do this together. We want to have companies in our industry, people who practice what we do, that they'll be able to compensate and hire people who can make a living from the occupation that they chose as their livelihood. Thus, they can have a good job, they can support their family, they can buy a house, they can plan for their kids' future and in return, these people will give back to the industry, like the early pioneers and trailblazers did. I think the industry then will have a place where people will graduate from institutions of higher learning with a degree in the profession. And those people will be desired and they will be sought after. I think we need to have more support for Purdue. People I'm not sure understand the importance and the value of that plays as it starts to build momentum. I think the industry um, will have a place for those who pioneered a path to the profession. They're going to know when it's time to pass the baton of stewardship, that they can retire knowing that they gave everything they had to make it better. And I think in the very end, there will be a time and a place where the people who are our generation that are going to pass the baton, we took it from people like Marty and whatever, that we're going to know that the promise that we made to ourselves and we made to each other over the years, that we've fulfilled this legacy, that we've entrusted the next generation to take the industry to a place that we never thought possible. They can stand on our shoulders and see higher and further, just like we did for the ones that came before us. You know, that saying of standing on people's shoulders to see higher and further, that was Joe Stebrook's initial reasoning for summer camp, that we had to learn from the old guys, they had to stand on their shoulders, see higher and farther, and pass it on to the next generation. It seems now the young guys then, 20 years later, are now the old guys. And uh, I guess in the final analysis, um, it seems to me that most of the industry organizations, if you go to their websites, you look at their missions, their goals, you look at everything that's up there, it seems that we have a lot more in common than we have differences. And it's not the organizations that have the issues. It's the people who... Uh, have influence in the organizations who, who uh, uh, you know, who serve the organizations, who manage the organizations. That's where the conflict. The conflict is always about the people, and then ultimately it spills over. The organizations are iconic; they're standalone. They represent the interest. Interest. It's when when the people, when the policies can be established, leadership can be had, interaction can take place. Then I believe the industry can come together and we can grow. And I guess my question now is, is our industry in decline or are we maturing? And maybe that can be how we can segue to the shift to the next 
part two of the show, whenever that is, kind of finish the points, bring it to the future, and then really me and Cliff can talk about, you know, where some of the things that we think that we can do in the future and where it can go and kind of build off off of this. But I only have uh, probably two things to add to what you said, Pete, and I never heard it before, and um, I, I, I think that there's one thing I would like to build on. Um, I, I think that we... Uh, as business people, as associations, I think we we need to consider uh, veterans that have protected us, uh, people that have been wounded. I I think uh, as business owners, as organizations, uh, there's something that we can do for you know, for those people that have uh, made the sacrifice. Uh, my final comment again goes back to the Godfather. You know, we all need to remember that this is the business that we've chosen. This is the business that we've chosen. Hey, I've got one thing I'd like to add, and then I'm going to let Pete finish it up here. Um, I just have one thing to say. This was a lot of fun, but it was very serious, and there's a, a very important message behind the show that we've done. We do important work. But I just want to say, he who ignores history is doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. And that's why I think this part of the show was so important. We'll talk a little more about the future in part two. I want to let Pete have the final word since this is his show. Yeah. Well, Cliff, Joe, thanks a lot. You know, I, we've been using some quotes, and I, I guess I, I got two quotes. I did the Mark Twain quote. I want to close with two other quotes. The one is Winston Churchill. And I heard this quote from Steve Rick years ago. And uh, he talked about it in the context of uh, the global countries working together in the building science community. He said, during the darkest days of World War II, when the Americans were sitting on the sideline, and, you know, Britain was the last stand, you know, as the, as the invasion was going to Europe, Winston Churchill said, said, don't worry, he says, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted all the possibilities. And what happens is, Possibility, exhausting possibilities takes time. So I guess the message of that and why that's important is, is that maybe the industry's exhausted all the other possibilities, and now it's time for the industry to get together and truly collaborate for the greater good. And the final quote, and I, and, and I think I actually want to defer to let Cliff get the final word before we close the show out of respect, is this. This quote is something that from Teddy Roosevelt, and I've had many, but, this, but Cliff gave this quote to me several, several months ago. And he said, Teddy Roosevelt basically said that every man you know, or woman back in those days before suffrage, he says, has an obligation to give back to the industry from which they derive their livelihood. In fact, no man has a right to withhold from that from which, you know, they, their industry. So in essence, what he's saying is, that's all about the social sector. That's all about giving back. You don't just take. You have to give back. If, if everyone in society just takes, we have no society, they have to give back. If everyone in the association just take and they don't give back, there'd be no industry. IAQ Radio Platinum Sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Gold sponsors are Particles Plus Engineers and Manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org and RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. we got to go back just a little bit to fill listeners in because summer camp is, is coming up on 20 years, and we all just came back from summer camp, another great 19th year. 
of the Westford Symposium on Building Sciences. But, um, you know, the first few years weren't, weren't like it is now. And at, at one point, summer camp exploded into basically an iconic and cult-like status. Pete, can you comment on that a little bit, uh, both of you? Yeah. Well, you know, when summer camp was started, with uh, Cliff and myself first met Joe Steebrook back in the early to mid-'90s, and he met Mac Pierce and a number of other, you know, uh, building science people, uh, uh, that were uh, that we just kind of ran into, and it became a point that I discussed on the last show, where when the old ASCR uh, launched the Water Loss Institute division, part of the marching orders for the institute was to uh, to have myself and some of the others go out and find people that um, could teach us stuff that we needed to know. In other words, I think we felt we all learned from each other, uh, and it was now time to find other people that we could learn from. And so uh, when, when we had a relationship with uh, Sue Smith and the Mid-Atlantic Mid Environmental Resource Center, we talked about that did a lot of the training for uh, EPA Region 3, and, um, and we also worked with Richard Shaughnessy from the University of Tulsa, that a lot of your IQA listeners know. Uh, he had like three or four regions um, that, uh, you know, did, um, did training uh, that was supported by the government um, for, you know, a wide audience of indoor air quality, building science uh, type practitioners. And so during those days, um, at one point we, we ran into Joe, and Joe had come up with this idea about wanting to have a uh, summer camp, but really it was a, a, a symposium at a very high level. And what he did is he invited two or three people from the different in, uh, disciplines or professions that made up the, the building science community, and Cliff and myself with the two from Restoration. And um, we came. And then uh, it just kind of evolved to, uh, you know, when I, uh, they didn't really know I was a cook, and then I kind of became the chef, and one thing led to another. But somewhere along the line, after about 10 years, it just, it just started to grow, and uh, the demand for it, the unique nature of it, and, um, you know, they built a kitchen for me, and uh, the, the crew expanded, I have a paid crew, volunteer crew, and... Um, uh, people started sending and, uh, you know, bringing unique foods from different parts of the world. And with one year, you know, a bunch of us went up to Alaska. We went fishing and we caught the salmon. We caught a bunch of halibut <laughs> and we shipped, shipped back and we served. And it's just uh, it's just kind of been like that. So it's just gotten to the point. And then I was kind of really very shocked when uh, the IQA uh, people inducted me uh, into their Hall of Fame based on, uh, you know, my, my involvement with summer camp. But, um, you know, it was really quite an honor. And uh, so anyway, it's work. It's, uh, next year is going to be the 20th, and uh, it's quite an event. It's uh, not easy to get in. There's, a, you know, there's always uh, some movement each year, but there's a core group of people who have come in for a long time. And uh, anyway, I don't know, Cliff, probably Cliff came back with that. been in a few years. He came back this year. thought that was nice. Maybe he may have a few words and we move on. Well, Pete, real quick I, before you do. Uh, was just, Go ahead, it, Cliff. It, it just it just grew dramatically. I mean, in terms of the number of people that were there, and you know, the first time we went, we could probably kind of network with each other because you know, there's really a you know, we didn't know the other people. There's a lot of information we didn't know, but you know, now pretty much you have you've got everything under roof. You know, I mean, from the roofing materials and the structural materials and the contractors and the product manufacturers, and it's uh, it's an amazing event. It was fun. And there was a good contingent of indoor air quality people and, and the restoration people and uh, manufacturers, and now I'm seeing a lot more energy-related people because all of these things tie together. They affect the indoor environment. Pete, just ballpark, how many people now show up for summer camp? Well, between 450 and 500 for Monday and Tuesday, which are the two big days, and, you know, it kind of starts on the weekend and it rolls over to the Sicilian night, which was last, uh, which was Wednesday, and then, you know, some people stay and they leave on Thursday. But, but Monday, Tuesday are the two really big nights. All right. I, I want to go back to the RIA for just a moment, the Restoration Industry Association, and I guess there, there's a note here that the Founding Fathers depart as the cleaners had left long ago. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So one of the things that happened, and I talked in the first part of the show, and, and, and uh, the association is going to be 70 years old next year, 
and we started in the, in the 1940s, and we've had four names. We had the original start as the National Institute of Rug Cleaners. Then they they changed over somewhere in the 60s or early 70s to the Association of Interior Decor Specialists, and that spells A-I-D-S. So in the, in the early 80s, we changed the name for the obvious reason. It became the ASCR, the Association of Specialists in Community Restoration. At the time when we did that name change, um, that was kind of an open process, and uh, we came up with it. Well, as the IHCRC grew, as the dynamic of restoration became more of a, you know, a specialized uh, industry itself, and it wasn't kind of rolled up with uh, remodelers and, uh, you know, cleaners, if you would, um, I guess the association, for whatever, probably was not serving the needs of the carpet and upholstery cleaning industry uh, as they would. And, and so when the Connections group started and a lot of the IICRC activities and the shareholder associations, many of them really kind of supported that. And we didn't have that many that were members of REA, unless they were companies with uh, large rug cleaning plants, some of the founding 10 members, and uh, they had a big carpet cleaning and a big restoration business. Companies uh, like Borders, for example, St. Louis, there's a handful of them around the country who have been members for a long time because they had restoration needs. So what happened is, I guess when when they got when the board got together to uh, to do the rebranding to REA, we realized uh, there was just uh, there was time to make a name change. We had done some um, uh, uh, surveying of the members and realized there was a very small percent of members that were still in the cleaning area, and mostly the founding fathers were, were the rug cleaners. And really, a lot of past presidents and um, you know great supporters of our association. So we made the name change, and it was done at the very high level quietly. I guess it was one of those things that was, they were knew that it was going to be flack, and uh, instead of asking for permission, you just uh, either ask for forgiveness or you just explain it. And that's basically what happened. Shortly after that, the founding fathers left, and um, and then they uh, the, the last convention we were at was 2010 in Atlanta. And then they, they started their own association. I think it, it was probably necessary, the Association of Rug Cleaning Specialist Parks. And um, I stopped at one of their shows in New Orleans earlier this year after DKI. I was in New Orleans for DKI, and they had their show coincidentally in a different part of town at the end of that week. And a lot of the founding fathers there, a lot of the you know the second generation, a lot of the past presidents. And I visited a lot of our members there who do rug cleaning and restoration and uh, and it was great, and um, I'm happy that, you know, they, they've done that. I'm hoping maybe next year for our 70th that some of them will come back and, uh, um, you know, and provide some special expertise on, on the roads and the areas related to restoration because there is quite a bit of that. So, you know, it is what it is. I mean, that's things evolve over time, and that's what happened. I mean, Cook may have some comments on that. He served with a lot of them when he was president and knows them very well, and they're really the leading experts in the roads in uh, that area in the world. We have some of the top ones, really. So, thanks, oh, Pete. I, I do have a couple comments. You know, I was there. You know, I think that there was some tension uh, between the uh, the rug cleaners and between uh, the restores. I think there was a pretty good system that, you know, pretty much presidency would kind of shift back and forth. They were alternating with a rug guy, a restoration guy, a rug guy, a restoration guy. Then it got a little bit more competitive when they, I think, decided to, you know, get the best person for the job. I, I think really the big issue is that uh, oriental rug cleaning uh, or you know plant cleaning goes back in the 40s. It was a technology that really didn't change the way they made the rugs, the way they dyed the rugs. You know, none of that stuff changed. And that business never really grew. I think when on-location carpet cleaning uh, came out, implant cleaners suffered. You know, some of them adapted, became on-location rug cleaners. Some of them uh, did not. So I think that while restoration was a growing industry, I think that plant rug cleaning was a declining industry and that, um, you know, we were looking at different, you know, we were looking at different balls. You know, and uh, I think that that's what happened, and I think it's it's good that it happened. In that, I think both groups are are better served, and uh, you know, life will move on, and uh, you know, we wish them well, and I think they wish us well. Yeah, I agree with that. Has the name change helped the association? Do you think, Pete? I mean, have you gotten more members? Has it um, helped? Yeah, you know, Joe. I I don't I think it's almost 
an odd issue. I, I don't think that the reasons that people would join and all that has to do with the name change. I think what the name change was about more than anything in the rebranding was it needed to be reflective of who the members were and what we represented. And I think one of the I think it's the, the true effect of the rebranding and and the turnaround that was done under Don Major's uh, you know um, uh, uh, when he was the executive director for those five years. It's going to be felt in the years to come because right now the association is moving towards the global model with the Canadian Council uh, rolling out the uh, special Australian conference in uh, in the fall, um, and, and hopefully they'll evolve, you know, potentially into a council. Um, you know, we've reached out to the Brits. I mean, we have a lot of uh, old school, uh, a lot of the leadership at the BDMA, the people that were involved in our association for many years, certified, you know, under our programs, a lot of influence there, a lot of crossover stuff. And I, I think it's moving. And the name Restoration Industrial is a, it's, it's a, gener- a generic name, and it's kind of like the United Nations. The United Nations is a global organization that's based in New York. Well, why can't RAA be a global organization? It just happens to have its headquarters in Washington, D.C. No one ever says that the United Nations is an American uh, organization. Well, I'd like to see people not say REA is an American Restoration Association. I'd like to see it be global. So in that in that regard, I think we're moving in that direction. I think that the people that did the planning in the rebrand back then, the board members and the staff, I think it was brilliant, to be quite honest. They got a lot of flack over some stuff, but I think time will tell, and let's, and, and let's just see what happens. All right, let's 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 move on a little bit. I don't want to go too far ahead, but I want to get some idea of who has influenced both of you, either professionally, personally, and historically, and, and I guess more important, why, and what can others learn from what you learn through these influencers? Yeah, well, I'll jump into that one really quickly, and, I, and I'll, I'll kind of answer that. You know, basically... Big influence to me. I, I'm a, I, I study the ancient Greeks. I don't know how that ever happened, but uh, you know, uh, uh, Plato and Socrates and uh, um, and Aristotle. If you just kind of listen to them, they figured out all kinds of stuff. You know, two thousand years ago, long before there was uh, Google computers or anything else in Greek and architecture and medicine and uh, social dynamics and banking. And um, you know, it's really the foundation of Western civilization that we know today. Um, but, you know, if I move a little bit closer, only a few hundred years ago, people like Gandhi, you know, who talked about a higher ethical standard and about doing the right thing. Um, you know, listen to people like Martin Luther King. Um, uh, you know, some of the quotes and some of the people that we reference are some of the founding fathers of America or influential people like Teddy Roosevelt and, uh, and um, Abraham Lincoln. Um, and, and John Adams and, and Thomas Jefferson. I mean, you know, it's really the kind of the spirit of democracy and, uh, you know, and how we operate as a civilization and really in, in, the, in the Western cultures. So it'd be kind of foolish for, for anyone to say it's kind of in their DNA that they don't influence us and that, they're, they're, you know, sometimes we don't need to really, you know, make stuff up. It's, it's kind of like there and it just kind of changes, you know, by the century and, and societally as society changes. But professionally, if I look at things that really affect kind of what I am as a marketing guy and uh, um, and a strategic guy and an advisor, you know, Al Reese and Jack Trout, who are the two guys who, who wrote positioning and wrote tons of books over the years. Uh, Jim Collins and all his goods are great and have built the last up and then Jerry Porras. Um, uh, you know, uh, all of the Stephen Covey stuff, Peter Drucker. I mean, these guys are the guys who have, have taken the timeless principles that really transcend. There's all, you know, obviously we're in the social media age and there's, you know, the times have changed, uh, maybe how we deliver, but the thinking processes, the principles, the foundations of good business, of good management, of ethical thinking, of doing the right thing, but those things really haven't changed. Um, so, you know, those are, those are kind of, uh, you know, the big picture stuff, but if we just get right down into the heart of the industry, you know, obviously Marty King, Major Law, and of course we're going to talk about Major, Major really brought the professionalism at the highest level to our industry. A lot of the early guys and early presidents and people that uh, are EA members and certainly know people like, like Reed Dow, Rusty Amarati, who's still around, who's, uh, uh, you know, good, very good friends with Cliff and myself. We started about the same time. He's the, the, the vice president, director, oversees all the operations uh, for Belcourt. Um, 
you know, uh, Mac Pierce, Sue Smith, who ran the, the program, Mike McGinnis. You know, the other thing is a lot of these attorneys are dedicated to the industry. People don't recognize the value. You know, I mean, we're, we're founded on the, on the rule of law as a country. And uh, there was a, once years ago, um, there was a quote by uh, somebody that uh, – she was a ch- the, the chair of the, of the Bar Association, and she addressed the graduating class of, the, the, of Harvard. And she, she started off by saying, attorneys are the foot soldiers of American democracy. You know, they're not, they're not always thought of in high regard, but good attorneys, they're advisors and they're counselors. And mo- a lot of the people listening to the show, and certainly I remember, were contractors. That means to contract. You contract with people by using legal principles of how to do projects, how to reach the meaning of the minds and reach an agreement. People like Ed Cross, David Governor, Michael Bowden, Harvey Cohen, you know, these are guys who have, are dedicated to the indoor air quality and the restoration industry, working with our members, and not only in the states where they're licensed to practice, but in other advisory roles in other areas. And really, um, uh, I think they're underestimated. You know, all my summer camp guys, uh, that have helped out with that. Uh, Paul Lagrange, uh, you know, Lou Herman, for all the years that I worked with him, uh, um, uh, you know, my office buddies, Ashley Easterby, uh, and Ian Aaron, and Big Ed from State Farm, you know, anyone who's come to summer camp or has ever been around know who all those people are. I mean, just the relationship we've created, the help that they've had, uh, it's really been timeless for me. And um, um, anyway, so that was a pretty long list. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Cliff. Cliff, uh, um, I, I think you know maybe author wise probably uh, again recent trout uh, probably Malcolm Gladwell uh, you know in terms of uh, you know of, of authors in terms of industry people you know certainly uh, Lee Pemberton uh, you know taught me how to write an estimate helped me validate my personal and I think professional self worth. You know, I think Major Wong, who was really an innovator and was creative and taught me the importance of being an early adopter and thinking creatively and thinking outside the box. Uh, he, he was definitely the biggest restoration influence. Uh, I, I really looked up to him, a fellow by the name of Murray Kramer. Uh, you know, he's just a great teacher. And you know, I was stuck when I was putting a training manual together. And you know, he just told me to start with a table of contents and, you know, but I had already written most of the manual. I just couldn't put it together. <laughs> and so uh, he told me to do a table of contents. It, it, it tended to you know, fall into place. Uh, I think Marty King, the thing that he taught me was using details to create value. And it didn't take me long to learn that you can charge more to clean a table made in the Chippendale style than you can, clean, than you can charge to clean one made in the Ikea style. Hmm. And, uh, Probably the you know the person who also influenced me the most was Lloyd Weaver. I think that you know hands down his air mover was and remains the single greatest innovation in restoration history. And I think he taught me to keep my eye on the ball, uh, the importance of loyalty, and uh, you know using humor as a uh, teaching tool. So thanks for letting me thank those people. I'm glad. Hey, hey, Joe. Yes. Well, so let me step off of that. I, you know, all of those people that that Cliff said, obviously, I, every one of those, you know, and I, maybe it goes without saying, but I, I definitely need to, to mention Joe Seabrook. And maybe I just made an assumption that everybody knows it, but you know, his whole brilliant idea of summer camp, you know, we must stand on the shoulders to see higher and further of those that come before us, uh, is really just a is a core principle. But you know, Ed York. I mean, Ed York was you know, was brilliant, and uh, if we took away all the brands in the industry that Ed York uh, created, it'd be hard to recognize the industry, but the IACRC, DKI, guys like uh, Denny Jensen or Frank Eaton, who were kind of the next generation to bring DKI to where it was, a fellow named Don Larson when I first moved to California, who had a critical component uh, as an ex-state trooper that uh, completed the DKI model when Ed York created it, of how they re- responded. Uh, you know, John Downey, I mean, he was just at summer camp. He's, uh, he's the publisher and the editor of ICRC Journal, the founder of Clean Facts. You know, Cliff, him and myself, you know, I, I think Ed York was the original watchdog, and then maybe John and Cliff and myself, we kinda, we're kind of descendants from him. So, you know, all of those people are really worthy of mentioning and thanking and, uh, and tremendously uh, you know, influential. Um, two historical figures. 
one is Ben Franklin. If no one's ever really looked at some of the Ben Franklin stuff, it's amazing the imprint that he has. And one of the other professional authors, I can't believe I got in with Tom Peter. You know, Tom Peter back in, he wrote The Pursuit of Excellence in the 80s, but then in the 90s he wrote The Pursuit of Wow. And The Pursuit of Wow, after I read that book, was the whole reason that I took my sabbatical. He talked about the big R, which means that at some point you people take time off, a minimum of six months or more, they drop out, they recharge their batteries, and they come back focused. And, I, I, you know, you don't wait till the end of your life to do that. You know, you do that at some point, you know, where you just need that to recharge your batteries. And, and I would encourage everybody to uh, to think about that and maybe try to find that book even used on Amazon. I think I think it'd be very motivational anyway. Hmm. Interesting. I did that in my 20s. Does that count? Well, it's a little R. Let's put it that way. That's why I think he called it the little R. <laughs> the little R. All right, let's 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 move on. Um, the history of the industry attempting to come together for the greater good. This is something that I, I've been trying to help you guys with, and, um, you know, it, it's really tough. Can, can you talk a little bit about that, you know, the early 90s, the original – ICRA deal, the summit 2008, etc. There's all kinds of interesting things that I don't know that everybody understands what all has gone on in an attempt to bring this industry together. Yeah. So look, I mean, at the end of the day, in the cleaning and restoration industry, there's, there's two major iconic groups, and that's that's IACRC and RAA. There's a lot of other ones, and there's a lot of regional associations, and there's many other related groups, but the two largest constituents that make up the cleaners and restorers fall somewhere under the, in my mind, the IICRC umbrella or under the ASDRIA umbrella. And for many years, the two organizations have been trying to find a common ground to work together to unify the industry, and there's been all kinds of things happening. But in the early 90s, the IICRC had a, a segment of that the regional associations worked together that was called the Partnership Board. And then eventually they developed this ICRA, the, uh, the um, uh, Institute for Cleaning and Restoration Associations. And so that brand is now being used uh, by a number of people, and, and also we've been the ISCRC as the Council of Associations. I mean, look, the IEQA started as being wanting being an association of associations, and we talked about that in part one of the show. So there was a, there was a deal that was almost made in – the early to mid-90s, where ASCR and the ISCRC were going to come together, and, and I believe, and, the, and if I'm historically a little bit wrong, it's, uh, how it was interpreted, it's not intentional, but we wanted to separate association activities from standards uh, setting and certification, and they, they're distinctly different in the model in the industrial hygiene community and many other communities, association activities uh, that, uh, that support members, that deal with networking, that deal with education, that deal with um, putting on conventions, the uh, industry trade journal is different than certification criteria, third party, continue education, standards, guidelines, uh, the technical journals, things of this nature. We want to try to, because there's too much overlap. Um, the deal, I think, at the 11th hour literally fell apart, and I believe it was based on politics and ego, um, and we'll leave it at that. Now, the next major attempt that took place was in 2008. And a couple things I want to comment on, Joe, and I made a, a few notes. So I didn't address them at the beginning of the show. They kind of rolled over from part one of the show. And it really has to kind of do with the standard setting. I may have addressed and talked a little bit. You know, I talked in the first part of the show with me and Cliff about the evolution of standards in the industry, the uh, the sewage guidelines that led, led to the first S-500, the second S-500, and then in the early 2000s, the, the third edition of the S-500 essentially uh, was the first ANSI edition, and um, uh, uh, S500 2006, and and I was on the editing committees for the first two in the 90s, and then they had me, after I came back from my sabbatical, they put me as a reviewer for bias uh, on, the, on the third edition. But um, one of the things that I think was real critical that happened, and it, it kind of, I, it still bothers me, is that in the first two editions, we developed a category a subcommittee called the Third Party Evaluators, which was a broad-based uh, thing. Anytime you needed someone independently on a project, they were called Third Party Evaluators. And then this IEP thing got formed and uh, kind of became the norm. And I kind of tended to think that 
when when they went from the second S five hundred to the third one, I, I kinda think they may have thrown the baby out with the bathwater where they started with this clean a completely clean sheet of paper almost with no consideration to what happened before. And that doesn't mean it's a bad document or anything, but, you know, sometimes things get lost like that, and, and there should be this transfer. I mean, I know under the ANSI rules, every 10 years, you know, you have to, you know, they have certain things that you have to do. you got to update every five years and all that. But when we went to that IEP thing, I think that became very political and created a lot of uh, kind of confrontation and animus between uh, many of the other associations that had people that would fall under this IEP, and how do you qualify them, and, what's a real credential, and uh, what's a made-up one, and all that kind of stuff. Um, right around all that same time, in the early part of the 21st century, the first decade, then, then they had the first attempt at the S520, which um, really uh, well, wasn't the ANSI. It came later, and uh, that was a very contentious process. And trying to kind of create common language between the water document and the whole document has been challenging, and maybe even today as, as they try to work through that. But at the time, and Cliff knows about this, the ASCR came out with a mold guidance document that Marty King worked on, Michael Pinto early then, and others, where we took all the documents outside of the industry, but all the government documents, the EPA and the New York City guidelines, and there was a number of the Canadian documents, and came out with just basic guidance. What did you agree with? What didn't you agree with? And the important thing there was, is nobody, the advice that a lot of the attorneys and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, experts gave was, is don't say that you just follow any one thing. You have a series of documents that you follow. You don't back yourself into a corner, and and you use a variety of documents. And I think that's probably a good message that that we don't lock in on one thing because no one thing really is a catch-all for everything. Um, during those days when Cook was the president and a lot of issues that I had, is I always felt that people that ascended to positions of authority in the industry organizations and nonprofits who sold their businesses and then became consultants. Where do you draw the line on overseeing conflict of interest, uh, enforcing your policies? Are, are guys going around and bolstering you know, their own reputations and mixing the dollars that are being paid by these nonprofits to represent those organizations? And then, then they're consultants, and then their names are in lights, and we went here and we did that. And, and two things that, that Cliff and myself, I think, were very careful of. When I took my sabbatical and I traveled around the world, it was on my dime and my dollar. It never went back. I told Cliff, when he was the president that year, he didn't do any training except the minimum they needed to do to maintain his credentials, IACRC. I said, Cliff, don't do what some of those other guys did. And, 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 and even to this day, I think it's gotten better. But I think the organizations need to be careful. They have to have oversight and be sensitive to that because that's the kind of stuff that hurts the organizations drives volunteers away, you know, creates bad problems, and, and, and then it backs up. And, and so I, I don't know, for whatever that's worth, I guess I need to get that off my desk. Um, Cliff, I want to turn it over to you, and if you want to talk a little bit about Chuck Rumbarger and then the beginning of the 2008, where that went, and maybe I'll finish it up, and then we probably could, could uh, maybe we'll probably be ready for halftime, Joe, and then we can move into the second part of the show. So Sounds you can, good. Go ahead. You can cover the Chuck report, Pete. Well, what happened then, Joe, in 2008, um, that year, uh, a, a group of people that were part of the Connections group, essentially, ISCRC shareholders, and RAA, right after we did the rebrand, we got together to have some some uh, meetings that we just, um, uh, we hired Chuck Rumbarger, who's a, a giant, um, and a, uh, he's kind of the Peter Drucker of the association management industry, and he came in and uh, gave us some guidance and some, uh, some lectures, if you would, on governance and the proper way to potentially have the industry come together, different models that we use, the federated model, and a variety of things. And um, uh, so RAA paid for some facilitating fees. The Connections Group hired them. And over the course of a year, the two groups were kind of being counseled, and we had discussions. And in 2008, it led to a meeting in Baltimore around the RAA conference, and all the Connections people came in. Um, uh, Rusty Amarathi, I think, was the president at the time for our association, and Craig Kirschmeyer was the president of the, of the Connections Group. Uh, Chuck Rumbarger, you know, a, a lot of board members from both were there, and um, we were trying to see whether we could kind of bring the industry together at that time, work towards some kind of consolidation model. And uh, anyway, somewhere along the line, towards the tail end of the meeting, there were a couple of flies in the ointment, and uh, something came up. It was kind of like, well, yeah, sure. Uh, Connections, and, and we'd be happy to have REA become one of 14. And at that point, the whole room kind of stopped. 
was never about being one of 14. It was about one of one. If you look at the membership of RAA and the membership of all the shareholder associations of the, the ISRC, they're about equal. It's one and one. It's, we're not one of 14. And people need to put their egos aside and, and need to, to, to look at the greater good if that's what they want to serve. And let's find a way to where we can, can, can agree to agree, agree to disagree. Let's find out if we, if we can't get you know, if we can't, it's not going to be a perfect war. Let's get the best compromise we can for the greater good of the people that we serve. And let's, let's try to move towards what we've been trying to do for 25 years. At that 2008 meeting, when I, I, I personally feel that some people intentionally, uh, intentionally sabotaged that meeting, I think it hurt the industry. I think there was a lot of money that was spent by the organization to send people there in good faith, and, and, and the industry was more divided. And now we're talking again in the last year or two, and the industry is still divided, but uh, but I, I hope it's going to get better. And uh, and so, you know, for whatever that's worth, I don't want to get to names and put people on there because any of the insiders know who the people are and they know who they are. But we don't need to name their names. What, what we need to talk about is what actually happened and, and how we can move past it. And that's what's important. I think that's the hard part, moving past it, Pete. I know... Um... I would love to see that happen. I think it would be good. IAQA and um, IAQ Council at, at the time kind of did the same thing. Unfortunately, it uh, didn't end up the way people would hope. But, you know, uh, it was an attempt at, at unifying that portion of the industry. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do the same thing with the restoration industry here. But uh, and, and the key is, like you say, it, you have to do it for the the people within the industry, not for certain individuals to um, to, to to benefit from, and, and we're we're kind of up to date almost, guys. Um, you know, we've got a an industry that's been changing rather dramatically. I I think at least in the last five years, maybe a little longer, we're we're seeing consolidation uh, within the commercial sector. There's some some fraction within the social sector. We've got trades being integrated, professions, maturity. Where where are we at, Pete? Well, you know, uh, before I move on, Cliff, you got any any kind of little comments that you wanted to dovetail off the last thing I talked about before the halftime? No, we're good, Pete. We're good. Okay, thanks. But listen, I, I think that you know, as industries grow and mature, there becomes a point where. You know where, where is the mature, where are they in the in the maturity curve? Are they are they have they leveled off? Are they still in an upswing, or are they ready to go and decline? And you know, I I think it's only speculative. I mean, there's probably economists and uh, you know some scientific types that probably can give real data. But you know, with guys like me, and I kind of go more on my gut on my observations, and I kind of think we're at a crosswords or in a delicate area that. I think that we're we're kind of treading water, and I think we're either ready for the next upswing or we're ready to go and decline. And of course, I'd like to see the sunny skies, not the not not the bottom of the cliff. You know, um, interesting enough, there's a I think the relationship between the insurers, the restoration industry, has gotten very tenuous at best, and uh, as it's grown and matured, um, as, as the standards evolve, as more people enter the market. Um, different states have different laws that affect, uh, you know, the work that we do. So I think it's important that the industry kind of self-regulates itself in these areas. I don't think it's something, I mean, public health stuff, if, if the industry, if industry doesn't deal with that, you know, the government will normally step in. But a lot, a lot of it is just the commercial and the financial relationship, um, you know, between the people that basically pay for the services, the ones that provide the services, and the ones that need the services. And, of course, in restoration, it's a unique third-party model. And usually insurance companies or some commercial or government entity as exposure will basically pay for the work of uh, disaster victims by the service providers. Um, I, uh, I think that in the commercial area, you see a lot of consolidation of a lot of large national companies and franchises. It's awful tough for independence that they don't have someone to lean on or some, you know, some brand that they can associate with, you know, it's kind of like the Walmarts and all the big box stores. It's tough for the small entrepreneurs and little retailers to survive. And I don't think that's any difference in the service business. I think that fractionalization, Joe, that we talked about kind of 
you know, really what I was talking about before the halftime. I, I think it's time for the industry organizations to uh, to decide, you know, how to collaborate. And there's a passing of the, of the baton now. We're in a, in, a, in a delicate area between the baby boomers passing on to the, the Gen X and the millennials who are, you know, the next generation that will, will be the ones that are moving into stewardship of the associations in the industry, and they're going to direct where we're going to go. And that's all happening. I think we need to, to work together and understand uh, the different, uh, you know, understand what it takes in order to, to, to be collaborative, to pass that baton, and for, you know, one generation to retire and for the next one to assume leadership. Cliff, do you want to add anything before I ask a follow-up? Um, just, you know, just one thing. I, I, I think that, you know, as Pete said, you know, to me, I think the future in many ways uh, is second generation or third generation restoration companies. I have a lot of faith when I see the son or daughter of a successful company taking the reins and, you know, they know the history, they've lived the history, and I'm real, real comfortable with, with that dynamic. You know, I think sometimes I'm a little uncomfortable with the dynamic of some person coming out of business school and, uh, you know, just, you know, just, just, you know, it just doesn't have the history. That, that's all. I, I'm like Pete, uh, you know, I, I think I'm partial to, you know, knowing the history. And I think when you know the history, uh, you know, you can build upon it. Well, let me, I think one of the things I see, I'd like you to, to comment on it. And Pete, you, you kind of started down this path with the big box stores and, and the fact that on the commercial side, it's going to be tough to compete as a small company because of that. But I think the bigger trend is the insurance industry um, is really, really starting to um, assert their dominance and their control over the, over the situation and I'm wondering if even if we, I guarantee you this, if we don't unify and work together, they will take control of things and you will become a commodity. If we do work together, there's a chance. How much of a chance, Pete? Well, I think, look, traditionally in the insurance sector, whatever happens in the auto body and the collision industry, normally those trends uh, will filter down to the property and rest, you know, the restoration area. And, you know, but a car is a thing, a house is a thing, but a house is also a home and a home that contains uh, people's lives and their personal possessions. So it's not as easy to apply what well, works in collision and auto body to home and property repair uh, in, in many cases, but in some there are, there are. So the way I look at it is I, I think that um, what's happened now is that there's when the industry is grown and they get opportunists in there, particularly in the economy's down, everybody, you know, with a, with a hammer and a, and a pickup truck and they're out there wanting to do their thing. And the guy, you know, buys a few air movers and at the emitter fire, maybe he may or may not take a class. And then he hears about all this money that can be made, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what I think is important is that the industry has to follow some accepted guidelines and standards. The insurance industry wants to apply. They like to apply cookie cutter. I mean, that's the way they think I get it. But sometimes the restoration is not the same as the cookie cutter approach you could take with a car. I mean, everybody knows if you own a Chevy, it costs so much to get it fixed and to change your oil. If you own a Mercedes, don't bitch about changing your oil if you can afford to buy a car like that. And, you know, get people a little more fussy about the service on it. Well, it's no different than the property repair industry. And, um, and I think that uh, we need to kind of keep our eye on that ball. Um, and the professional industry, they need to distance themselves. From, from the guys that are out there who really are the gouchers, the guys who are not following anything, you know, who are really probably inappropriately overcharging or overscoping or, um, you know, uh, hey, look, Joe, you know in the IQ and the mold uh, stuff, there's all kinds of charlatans out there and the, and the duck cleaning. There's been all kinds of exposés on channels, some of the stuff that these guys say to take advantage of the consumers, you know. Well, the, 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 the rest of the, the professional industries need to dip themselves. Otherwise, what happens is the insurance industry or others, they kind of paint us all with a broad, broad brush where they say, you guys. That would be the equivalent of a restoration guy who got in some kind of dispute with an insurance adjuster or a TPA, you know, over some bill and saying, all you guys are like that. Well, we know they're not all like that. Some are hard ass. 
Some take certain lines, and others are different to work with. So you just can't paint everything with a broad brush. You have to put it in context. And I, and I think that's part of professionalizing, and that's part of growing and maturing, and an industry coming together to 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 have a, a, a representative voice when they have to deal with the insurance industry as a whole, deal with standards, deal with government regulations, deal with public health risk. That's the reason why the industry in the social sector, we need to put aside some of this pettiness, um, which is driven by special interest, which means that the people who are in charge, who take leadership positions, they, it's only time for the most serious people now. That We have to enforce our own policies. We have to have good policies about conflict of interest. We have to be willing to to call people on the carpet. We have to have our leaders that are, are able to model and set a good example so, you know, people in, in glass houses don't throw stones. And I hate to think I'm you know, preaching here in the choir, and I'm certainly not saying that I'm perfect and, you know, we've all got our flaws. But, you know, we don't talk about it in an open and honest way. It isn't going to get better by itself. So, Cliff, anything you'd like to add on that topic? Um... You know, I, I think a lot of it comes down to leadership, Joe. I think people in leadership positions, uh, you know, they, they need to get things done. It's not just about going on, going along. Uh, you know, when you're in a leadership position, uh, you know, as president of an association or chairman or, or whatever, you know, you come in. There, there's there, there's policies, there's procedures, there's action plans that are that are already in place. You know, RIA just put together this you know strategic plan. So uh, next president kind of doesn't have a whole lot of choice in terms of which direction the association is going. But when you get in there. I think you should try to do one thing to make a difference. I think you need to look at your association uh, and, you know, you do this SWOT analysis, you know, a strength, a weakness, an opportunity, uh, a threat, and figure out which one of those is the most important to you and kind of push that really along. And there have just been some mistakes made, I think, in these organizations, you know, in terms of management. Uh, you know, some of them, you know, for, we had the self-management model for a long time and, and that's good, but you know, there's a difference between hiring a manager and having you know, someone that's a, a trained, certified association executive. And I think having those types of people, you know, is, is a big step. You know, I think a lot of times what would happen in, in, in associations is, uh, someone would, uh, either be asked to leave or leave on their own. And then we would automatically promote the next person. You know, that could be the secretary or someone like that who was, uh, uh, you know, totally untrained uh, to take over. So I think, you know, these are, uh, you know, asking for, uh, competitive, proposals, going through the due diligence, asking for references and and so on and so forth, uh, will make it better. And either in either situation change uh is difficult, but I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah, that's that's what we want. Um now we're we're kind of moving to the point where you know we're, we've talked a little bit about some of the big picture issues facing the industry today, what we want to be when we grow up. You know, you've talked about passing the stewardship baton on to the next generation, trying to come together as one to deal with, you know, things like regulations, standards, competency, and, and to make sure that we have long-term growth, viability, prosperity, all of those things. Now, I, I got a text in from a listener that kind of ties into the most pressing issues facing the industry today, and I want to add this one to the list. I know you guys already want to talk about, and I'm going to change it a little bit in that um, they talked about losses caused by global warming, increasing insurance costs, and they're going to become more and more stringent. I want to add terrorism and acts of terror and how they also have affected the insurance industry. And, and let's just not even get into global warming, but just I think we all would agree that you know, we're seeing changes, at least in the way um, weather patterns come and the amount of rain and heat and so on and so forth, What whatever is causing it. How do you guys see these big pictures for the future? All right, so listen, this thing on the, the global warning, in 2003, at one of the, the, the last, I think, uh, WLI conference, David Bierman gave a keynote address dealing with the World uh, Organization that dealt with that, saying that that was in effect the industry for years to come. In 2004, we had an, an 
economist from the University of Michigan that talked about that at one of our conferences in Philadelphia. And they said that, that, that the effects of global warming and the weather patterns in the world were, there was going to be a lot of, a lot of damage that there was going to be a need for the restoration industry. And then after that, you know, we had the tsunamis and all kinds of these global disasters. So there's going to be work, whether the insurance companies pay, whether government entity pays, whether a commercial organization pays. There's going to be damage. There's going to have to be somebody to clean it up and mitigate it, and there's going to have to be some money or resources to pay for So that's kind of a given. Um, I think that uh, that right now, you know, look, like Cliff mentioned, the REA just went through some strategic planning. The IQA, now under the Ashray umbrella, went through strategic planning. As you know, the IEQA went through a kind of a consolidation there a few years back. Joe, you kind of alluded to it when the ISO and um, uh, uh, the American Indoor Air Quality Council and all of that, and that kind of had its little bit of the day. And uh, and now, you know, and look, there's mixed viewpoints and opinions on IEQA that as many of your listeners are well aware. Should we have come under ASHRAE, not come under it? You know, and, and look, uh, you can make a pro or con uh, for either one. But, you know, my, my viewpoint is, is you know, coming under ASHRAE and a major organization like that, I, I think is a good thing. And um, I think, you you know, as an organization, they're going to work through the new model, just like REA is working through the professional model, working with, uh, with Smith Buckland, the, the largest and the giant in the, uh, in the um, association management field. They have tremendous resources. And, you know, you can't take someone who's been self-managed for an organization for 60 years and think overnight that, you know, it's just going to change like that. The IHCRC, they have the same challenges. Okay, that's it. We'll, we'll figure that kind of stuff out. But um, but there's other pressing stuff. I mean, the patent stuff is something. But uh, but the patent is a global issue. In our industry, it was very specific around the use of heat. And, uh, but um, if you look out there, I mean, Apple is involved in globally in patent suits and a lot of it in the biotechnology area. But I think those things just kind of come and go. Uh, for, for the restoration industry, I think the emergence of uh, the the EPA third party administration uh, uh, third party administrator networks, um, I think the margins are falling. A lot of restorers are very concerned about that. There's a low point of entry to get into the profession. I mean, there's a movement in the industry by some of the players who basically want to see the point of entry raised. So it's not so easy to just get that hammer, or get a couple air movers, throw it in the back of a pickup truck, hang your shingle. Um, you know, I have mixed feelings about that. At the heart, I'm a libertarian. I really don't think that the government, I, you know, inviting the government for more regulations, I'm not crazy about. But having said that, I believe that government plays an important role. It goes back to the founders, and they need to provide the safety for the citizens, and they need to, you know, allow the economy to flourish. And the, there should be laws that, um, you know, uh, I believe it's law government. Let's put it that way. I believe in entrepreneurialism. So uh, I don't think we need to be dependent on the government. So. Raising the bar entry, I kind of get it, but I'm not sure what that looks like. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna reserve my viewpoint in that. Um, I, I I think the bar should probably be raised some, but I don't think it should be ridiculous. And then that kind of leads to monopolization, and then you violate antitrust and the government. You know they don't like that at all. But um, so I think those are are really uh, important uh, emerging issues. I think standardization, coming to agreement on certification. The body of knowledge that's being developed, we talked about in the last show by the REA, and we've invited AIHA, IQA, um, the uh, the folks at the Restoration Sciences Academy, and the IICRC to uh, to come out and give us an organizational review. What do we leave out? Um, uh, what don't we need in there? Uh, you know, we want to try to reach industry consensus. That by the time that's published next year, there will have been a six-year process. That's part of the growing and maturing process. Uh, where we're at with Purdue and uh, how that whole thing's evolved. That, you know, Randy Rapp, the professor of Purdue, we talked about in part one with that summer camp, too. That, I think, is an important part of industry growing, maturing, and it's part of the credentialing process to get credibility with government and industry that uh, that profession has, has formed. So, to me, these are the kinds of things that I think we need to concentrate uh, on as an industry. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.